¿Probó? Ahora sí, ahora sí. Sí, la banalidad, ¿dónde? Okay. Can we start? We are live, also in streaming. Okay, okay. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be on the stage today. And uh, I want to say uh, thank you to be here with me. And I'm Michel Mourouli. Uh, I'm working as a organizer of NGO. With me, uh, hi guys. Uh, very nice to be here uh, again. And, uh, so, let's start with the Niger on Summit for this year. Okay, so let's start with uh, a big thank you for all of you that are here with us and uh, also for the people in the whole uh, in the streaming, as we all know. Uh, yeah, um, so let's start to follow us. Some uh, accounts on social, so LinkedIn and, uh, and uh, Instagram. So let's share some pictures of the day that we are enjoying. Also, some selfies with this video. So uh, let's contact and uh, uh, interact with the uh, staff speakers. And let, let's do a recap of the NGO. So, how did you, uh, no, 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 no. In, uh, yeah, no, in the uh, How many of you was last year in Spazio Novecento? give you the opportunity to sign the great workshops. Okay. Uh, last year we did a great workshop with uh, Brian Love and my Brian and we uh, we did time in yes and great and easier we try to share the basic so what we did is that we uh, invited Alisa uh, to to uh, give us a workshop from uh and one day we had another and so that's what we try to do here. And uh, of course, for the conference to be, uh, you know, uh, it really, and it's very simple. Uh, very easy for this time. And of course, we expect 
seeing and what and more information about the project content that we offer online, but of course, all of us are definitely more than we should So if you go ahead, uh, and uh, Pavel and Alex uh, are directly coming from uh, Angular about the trends and big uh, And um, yeah, thank you guys. Um, and also for the closing keynote, we will be uh, focusing on um, Azure Open AI and interaction with Angular. And that talk will be given by Natalia. That she's directly coming from Microsoft. So again, uh, great thank you for you too. Um, in the morning session, we will have three talks. One is from uh, Marco, then we have Davide and Maya. Uh, few of them are uh, people that already attended last conferences. So maybe it's people that you already know. And uh, of course, they're very, very happy to share with you uh, and chat. And then in the afternoon, we have Massimo, Lisa, Gerard, and Giuseppe. Uh, we will have these uh, four sessions and then few information about the agenda will be seen on the screens that you find in the in the room and of course uh, online. So go and scroll so you want to check the content and the agenda. Oh, yep. let, let's continue with say thank you also to the partner of the conference. So thank you, Microsoft, that uh, uh, hosts the, yep. the, the, the conference. Uh, so uh, without Microsoft, uh, we uh, maybe don't, don't, yep. don't be here today. And uh, I want to say thank you also to support us. So Partner and ICT Loop is uh, also. From, yeah. uh, I will say something more. They are like <laughs> part of the conference. Yeah. Yeah. Every year they are here. We, so we do the conference great. just for yeah, them. just for them. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you also to for Vento and yeah. um, uh, Pact Contendo uh, Sticker Mule and Slido. We are using Slido of today to have more uh, connection between yeah. the talks, between the uh, panel. Uh, you can do some questions using direct And so, um, yeah, as I last, said, yeah. but not least, we we have uh, Okta as a diversity partner. And uh, also with uh, NG Girls, we every year uh, uh, a workshop for uh, diversity and inclusion. And last but not least, the communities. So Angular, uh, NG Rome uh, was, was born uh, yeah. from, a, from a community. So uh, we meet each other for this edition of NG Rome. But uh, today I want to say thank you to .NET Code that. Uh, Organize uh, the live streaming, uh, give us the opportunity to uh, have a uh, hundred people here in the in Microsoft. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and so thank you, Luca, for uh, for this, and thank you also to all the communities that uh, support us each year. Yeah. So I think I think we can start. Yeah, we can start. So it's and, time uh, to introduce Powell and uh, Alex. Alex.
Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Good? Cool. Awesome. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, happy to be here. This is my first ever NG Rome. This is fantastic. Um, so I'm joined by uh, my partner in crime and signals, Pavel Kozlowski. Um, and we're here today to answer kind of an interesting question. Um, Pavel came up with a title for this talk, I think with NG Rome in mind. Um, us, like where are we going? And this is kind of an unusual talk for us. Quite often at conferences, especially in keynotes, we're talking about the things we've done, right? The things we've launched, the new features that are part of new releases. We're gonna do something different here. We're gonna kind of look in the crystal ball a little bit and look forward and see where is Angular actually going? Um, so that means we're gonna be very honest with you about the direction that we see the framework taking. And that comes with a little bit of uncertainty. Um, so just remember, all of the priorities, the designs, the kind of direction we're talking about, things can change as we, you know, as we learn new things and as the web evolves. <laughs> so earlier this year, people started noticing that something was going on with Angular. It kind of felt like the team just woke up and, and got to work. So what's actually happening there? Uh, is there something big going on? And it turns out there's actually two things that make right now a really unique time for Angular. The first is that we're actually in a really healthy place as a project. We have a fantastic team with excellent leadership. We have a code base that's very healthy that allows us to kind of experiment and innovate very quickly um, and iterate on new ideas. And the second thing is that we've actually been around for a while. Angular 2 is eight years old. We have years of experience building this thing and eight years of back from developers like yourselves. Um, we also have eight years of experience seeing where the web is going and how other frameworks are tackling some of the same problems. And that's a privilege and a really significant advantage, actually. Um, there aren't many web technologies that have been around for that long and have that much history. So we're in a strong position right now to innovate and evolve the framework, which brings up a question, like, where do we go? What do we actually do with the knowledge and the capacity to innovate that we have? And to answer that, we asked ourselves kind of an even more fundamental question. What guides our decision making? What do we actually care about? How do we decide what problems are important to focus on? And I think if we, you know, if we talk to anyone on the team, they'll give you a different answer to that question. But as we went through this exercise, we came to realize that at heart, all of our motivations shared a single core focus, that we value your time and your energy. And we think you should be spending that time and energy building the products that will delight your users and not on micromanaging or babysitting the framework or trying to figure out how to get Angular to do what you want. So looking at our future through this lens of valuing your time and energy, we see three big opportunities in front of us, three areas we want to focus on. And we'll dig into them today. That is how we can make Angular a capable tool for building great user experiences how we can shape it to have a first-class, excellent developer experience, and how we plan to invest in the framework's future over the long term. So let's dive into that first opportunity. Let's talk about the user experience of Angular applications. And we think that building a great user experience should require a lot less work than it does today. And this is not a statement about Angular, actually. We think this is true on the web in general. We don't think this is a solved problem. Part of the challenge is that the bar for what constitutes a great user experience keeps getting higher. Core Web Vitals sets this goal of two and a half seconds for the largest contentful page, basically the initial load of your application. And that's a very unforgiving target to meet. And to meet that target, developers have to juggle a lot of different technologies. You have content delivery networks, edge computing, kind of backend RPC frameworks, et cetera. The more we can do framework to handle those concerns for you, the more of your time and energy you'll be able to spend on shipping features instead of optimizing for initial load. And we call this strategy performance by default. And it has kind of two prongs. The first is that we just want to make it hard for you to write code that doesn't perform well. The framework should guide you with its API designs, with its feature choices, with guardrails, so that you don't accidentally create performance problems in your applications. 
Secondly, you shouldn't have to worry about hand optimizing things and keeping up with what the kind of current state of the art is for a fast user experience. Angular should be able to do that for you behind the scenes. And you can already see these principles in action in some of the features that we've shipped in version 17, for example, with the new control flow. So with NG4, one of the things we saw is many, many developers would not include track by in their NG4, either because they forgot that it existed or didn't realize the impact on performance that it might have for certain situations. And so with the new four block in control flow, we've made track expressions not only easier to use, but also required so that you don't accidentally fall off this performance cliff. Here's another example. If effects, the new effects in Angular are, are mutating signals, that can lead to kind of inefficient update paths where we have to render things multiple times. So effects don't let you do that by default. You can still choose to opt into it. We don't want to take capabilities away from developers. We want to make it easier for them to kind of do the right thing and be aware when they're risking doing something that might cause issues. On a bigger scale, one of the many projects that we're working on, one of the main projects at the moment, is support for zoneless, running Angular applications without Zone.js. Zone has been a big part of Angular for the last eight years. But in that time, we've started to see some of its critical deficiencies. Um, it's a non-trivial amount of code to load. It has a tendency to overreact to things. And it's not giving us the kinds of information we want to optimize applications at the level we'd like to do. So zone is about 35 kilobytes, um, which gzips down to roughly 12. It's a non-negotiable startup cost. You're paying that every application load. Angular is then using zone to run to drive change detection in response to something happening on the page. So set timeout event fires, user clicks a button, et cetera. Angular does its thing, updates the application under the assumption that you might have changed something in the UI that needs to be refreshed. But that's not always the case. Not every interaction in the browser results in a state change that needs to be change detected, but Angular doesn't actually know that. So this is a modified version of a fairly optimal Angular application. We've added logging to each change detection cycle so we can kind of see how often as you can see, this application is doing like 100 change detections on part of it. Um, there are many ways you can accidentally get into this situation. And Zone kind of doesn't give you any, um, any warning that this is going to happen. And that's because Zone doesn't really tell you what this change in the application, only that something might happen. So we're kind of forced to assume the worst in that sense. And then Angular is going to do this global operation, walk through the component tree and verify that the whole UI is up to date. And many developers today optimize their application with onpush. They keep specific components and opt them out of this global change detection flow and say, no, Angular, I will tell you when this specific thing needs to change. You don't have to check it every single time. But that's the kind of hand optimization that we want to avoid. We don't think developers should have to focus on making sure their components are going to stay performant as their application scales. So we've been looking at ways we can do better, and that's where signals fit into the story. There are two things that we're getting from signals that we're not getting from Zone.js. The first is this positive indication that something has changed. When you update a signal and you're using that signal in your template, Angular doesn't have to do any guesswork. It doesn't have to make any assumptions. We know that UI needs to be refreshed, and we can kind of avoid overreacting to events that don't happen to change state. And the second thing is we know exactly which components are affected by that change. And that means we don't have to go through this top-down global update process. We can target the update specifically to the components that need refresh and no other. And you start to see some of these optimizations in version 17. Components that are inside of on push trees that become dirty through signals don't need to change attack their parents. That's something that the previous kind of on push mechanism had to do. We can check those components directly, as well as any children that might depend on the new state. Right? I think the community termed this local change detection. Um, we think that's a good start. But we want to go further. If we know that your templates only depend on signals, we can optimize even more. And we can check individual views, or even if it made sense to do so, individual findings. 
And this is the idea behind the RFC, what we call signal components. Components that know that signals are the only way that they depend on state. And with signal components, we could do even better and target changes to whatever granularity happens to make sense. That lets the framework optimize for you under the hood without you having to kind of give us the information for every single thing that you're using. <laughs> and improving this change detection performance really helps. But to optimize the initial loading experience, we need to do a few things more. There are kind of two obvious solutions to this. Either load less code and make the framework smaller, or make the code that we do load more efficient, make it run faster. Making zones optional is a great example of kind of making the framework smaller. If we get rid of that, the new control flow also does this. Um, using just the new for blocks and if blocks instead of ng4 and ngif will save about 10 kilobytes that would almost certainly end up in your initial bundle otherwise. And we've made the control flow faster. Um, this is this <laughs> rainbow here um, is the big green table. This is a benchmark that framework authors use to track performance of different frameworks with different rendering tasks. Um, and our new for loop implementation actually addresses a longstanding inefficiency in ng4. So this is Angular as a version 16 uh, using ng4. And we don't look so great on some of these benchmarks. And this is just due to how ng4 list diffing was implemented, kind of something that landed in version 2.0 and was not really updated since then. And the new control flow actually alone moves us a significant distance to the left in this table. Um, there's some tweets about the, the kind of comparisons with different frameworks, and we'll get into it here, but Angular is looking pretty good in this sense. But there's only so much smaller and faster we can get, right? When we start removing that much code, eventually you have to start removing features. Uh, you know, you can't just have a framework that has all the options and not have the code that one thing we can do is to actually make the framework smarter to kind of maybe not load everything at once, but be able to load things over time. Um, that means doing less work in the critical path, right? That LCP path on the initial load, usually by pushing the work to the server or doing it later on the client. Um, and often we'll employ this strategy kind of simultaneously as we get on different optimizations. So not surprisingly, server-side rendering is a big part of this story, right? If you, there's work that you can do before you get to the browser, it makes sense to usually do it there. Um, we've been working on making SSR kind of more streamlined and easily accessible um, in Angular. You've already seen us take Universal and incorporate that into the core framework. Um, we've optimized SSR to run in more places like edge computing environments. But we have a few bigger projects on the horizon kind of aimed at the integration of server-side rendering um, and the initial load optimization. So let's talk about a few of them. And these are kind of investigations. These are not fully designed features. We don't know if these are going to ship or not, but these are things we're kind of experimenting with to see if they move the needle significantly enough for us to invest in actually delivering. So one such project is screaming, right? Today, server-side rendering in Angular behaves much like a client-side rendering. You bootstrap the application on the server. There's some kind of DOM tree that's getting created. And when the application is stable, whenever all the data fetches are returned, when everything renders, then we kind of snapshot that DOM tree, turn it into HTML, and send it to the client. With more granular information about which parts of the application are ready to render, which have received their data, we can start sending HTML before all the data fetching has happened on the server and kind of you know, optimize this process so the server is still loading data while the browser is able to start rendering. Event delegation is another interesting technique that we're looking at. That's where we use a kind of single global event listener instead of an event listener on every element that you declare kind of an event binding to. Um, this has benefits like eliminating the cost of registering those listeners. That's something that's kind of traditionally slow in browsers. Um, but it can also help make the page more interactive in cases like hydration. So another technique that we're looking into is something we call partial hydration or progressive hydration, depending on which definition you read. Um, we think that can be a really valuable optimization, where coupled with APIs like we have for the defer block, you can declare that a part of your UI is not 
critically important during the initial load. And Angular can actually leave that code unloaded until the user starts interacting with it or until it ends up in the viewport or some other trigger like that. And in all of these investigations, we actually have kind of a, a partner behind the scenes. Um, there's a team at Google called Wiz. They build a framework um, that's used on some of the largest Google products, including Google Search. And they have 10 or so years of experience using these techniques in production um, in some of the kind of the biggest and most performant applications at Google. Wiz is the framework that inspired a lot of interest in techniques like resumability um, that have been explored a lot recently. And in particular, they're really knowledgeable about where these techniques make sense, where they provide benefit, and where the cost is not necessarily worth the benefits that you get, where the trade-offs don't really make sense. So having the technical capability to optimize these things is essential. But what's equally important is making those optimizations accessible to you as developers, making it easy for Angular to do them for you without you having to kind of micromanage what's going on. For example, uh, a common technique, common optimization is lazy loading components. And that's been possible since about version nine in Angular. You've been able to load a component independently of the router and instantiate it somewhere on the page. But it's never been very easy, right? There's kind of a bit of boilerplate involved to loading this thing, creating ng module associated with it, et cetera. Instead, we've shifted to kind of building APIs that try to capture your intention. Right, not your intention translated into unrelated framework concepts. Then the framework can actually do the heavy lifting for you. And in many cases, um, as these new APIs become available, we can actually do different optimizations behind the scenes um, because you're giving us information about what you want to achieve, not necessarily hard coding to the framework how you want to go about achieving it. So to optimize lazy loading in Angular 17, we introduced the defer block. And the defer blocks don't require writing any dynamic imports or callbacks or kind of promise chains to go and create this component. They don't require you to interact with the container. Instead, you declare to Angular what's important to you as developers, which parts of your template you want to kind of defer loading, and when it's important for that content to be present. And then the framework can handle the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So um, the next kind of thing we wanted to talk about beyond user experiences is optimizing the framework developer experience. And I will turn it over to Paul. Thanks. So, <laughs> so I think at some point we uh, coined the term corporate Monday just to indicate this, you know, like you had great weekend to come back to work and you go, oh my God, I have to do this. Right? Like, uh, and th that's exactly how we don't want uh, Angular to feel. So let's look at some of the places where we can actually make the daily work of the framework easier and capture this intent. And that's really, this intent comes from recognizing the fact that web development is hard already. Right? Like there are so many technologies and languages that we can think of. There are so many tools, like just uh, learning a framework is learning the entire ecosystem. So, uh, we had this, like, you know, we are kind of juggling a lot of technologies, uh, but like running a marathon at the same time is probably not what you want to do every day, especially on Mondays. And um, many projects that were on our roadmap and are on our roadmap uh, are specifically trying to target this, make work with the framework. Uh, so essentially, we are saying, okay, Working with the framework should be easier. The X is important, but what it does, what it really means, right? Like it's very easy to say, like, oh, we care about the DX, we want to improve the X. What does it mean in practice? And you know, probably different teams with different frameworks will have different takes on it. But when we were discussing, it's like, hey, we want to improve the DX or mechanics of working with the framework, that's really boils down to really few uh, kind of cornerstones. One of them uh, being really starting with the foundations of small building blocks that we can freely compose. And so obviously the less concepts to learn, um, hopefully it's kind of you know easier to master and, and uh, teach the team 
uh, how to kind of operate with the smaller number of things. But also like small number of things is not enough. The small number of primitives should be well working together. We should compose them to create a bigger thing. So this is one, uh, that's kind of what we spend a lot of time of our energy of like looking at all the APIs or all the new things that we are introduced into the framework to make sure that uh, it's a minimal primitive, but also that it works well with the other primitives. And then when you land on this primitive, uh, there is a time where you need to wrap it in the API. And as Alex pointed out, we want those APIs to speak in the LTO language of the language of the application developer instead of reflecting internal of the framework. So this is kind of this being less weird, both in terms of how we uh, speak to you, how we present the capabilities to you, but also how we borrow <coughs> ideas uh, from the ecosystem. Too often in the past, we were creating our own solutions where there were well-established solutions in the JavaScript ecosystem. And I think we want to slowly change it uh, by uh, borrowing patterns that work well and that we are, might be familiar with. So uh, I think one of the flagship projects that all those things come together is obviously again, that's that was the uh, our focus for the last few months or a couple of releases. Uh, and I guess at this point, uh, you've heard about those three fundamental concepts of reactivity that we introduced, like signals, computing, and ethics. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about them here because uh, I'm sure that you've heard a lot of talks, both from us and other team members. But what I want to talk about is this fact that there is just really, uh, we were looking for this very small set of core primitives that can express the entire data flow uh, or state management uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, and like really, uh, you know, without going into the mechanics of signals, uh, we probably didn't speak enough about the, all the nice properties that we are getting from this small set of things that can work together. So this one primitive of a signal and computed being a signal as well, allows us to drive all the change detection that happens in the framework, right? Like this is the only thing you need to know. It's like, hey, I've got the signal, I have to read it in the template. I need to update it somewhere and the UI should be up to date. Uh, but it's so, so this is the primitive or the language that you can use to talk to the framework. So it always have the UI uh, synchronized with the data model. At the same time, this one primitive, this one language can be used by the framework to speak back to you. So um, input as signals or input uh, express as signals is a great example of the places where we could use signals to express uh, data changing over time to you. And probably there are many other opportunities. We will talk about some of them. Uh, finally, this, uh, this one primitive of signals can be used anywhere. Right? Like I can express my state in a component. I can move it to, um, to a service and inject it through the DI or really declare it in the any TypeScript file if I want to. So you've got this freedom of refactoring. You can start with the state in a component and then pull it into a service and maybe like share it with the other uh, application. Even. And this primitive is also very interoperable. I can bridge the gap to other reactivity systems if I want to. So that's probably not new to you at this point, um, but I think we were not vocal enough about the fact that there are signals of this new reactive primitive is just only a tool uh, to catch a much bigger fish. And the, the bigger fish that we want to catch is really simplify the entire data flow, like reasoning about, about the data flow in the application. Uh, as we were exploring reactivity and all the state management uh, problems, we quickly realized that like mechanics of reactivity is one part of the problem. But the other big part of the problem is actually structuring your application. Like where do I where do I keep data? Should it go to the components? Should it go to a service? How do I fetch data? How do I manage like errors from data fetching? So all those concepts are kind of linked to reactivity. Uh, but um, kind of, you know, that's not mechanic work, but it involves a lot of thinking on you know, how do I structure my application. And I think like Angular can take on of this 
And signal-based components um, are kind of there to ease the data flow, just kind of to make the, the whole reasoning about data flow uh, simpler. So how do we how do, how do signal based components kind of improve the situation? Well, we could start by uh, screaming at developer slightly less. Uh, I I I, <laughs> I reckon that you have seen this error, right? Um, so so that that's kind of you know this is a good example. This error is a good example of a framework telling you that you did something wrong, or in framework's opinion, you did something wrong. So what is the horrible crime that you committed uh, that justified the framework to screaming at you? Well, uh, you violated one of the very fundamental rules of unidirectional data flow. And the framework is very quick to tell you about it. And it's all good and well, we kind of, I think we intuitively feel that like if someone if something falls in one direction, it's probably easier to reason about that it falls everywhere. That's all good, but hey, who sets the direction of this flow? Right? Like we didn't, we probably didn't answer this question in the past, kind of. And well, we kind of answered this question technically because currently in the Angular uh, change detection mechanism, there is hard coded data flow. It flows from top to the, to the bottom as the you know from the UI component hierarchy in a certain order. Um, and the fundamental observation here is that, uh, or like fundamental assumption here is that we saying that the data should flow exactly as the components are structured on your page. The trouble is uh, that there are some examples uh, of pretty common development scenarios where this assumption is not fully correct. So let's look at the form. Uh, you've got like two input fields. You want to make sure that both male and repeated male uh, match. In terms of UI component hierarchy, we are clearly having a form that is a parent of the two input fields. No denying here. When we think about data, the form validity status is actually de derived from the what we got in the input field. So where should we flow this data, right? Like we clearly see those, those things do not match. And I think the realizations we kind of uh, came, to, came to appreciate is that actually the data flow is independent of the UI visual hierarchy, right? So we, in, in terms of data, like the form derives its status from inputs, but in terms of the UI, uh, we are kind of seeing the inverse hierarchy. And obviously those two hierarchies needs to meet at some point because we display the data, but fundamentally uh, we want to have data that are really computed and uh, before we go into the change detection, before we start uh, thinking about the, how data are displayed. So a lot of efforts that we are kind of doing on both uh, signal-based components and uh, in cooperation with state management libraries, and I will talk about it in a sec, is kind of bringing some order to the data flow in the application. We want to kind of have this well-ordered free phase uh, situation where something happens in the browser, you click on a button you've, or you've got other interaction, then all your data is computed. You can reason about your application purely in terms of data, like now is my form valid? And then finally, uh, like you do the framework, uh, let the UI update. And we kind of see these patterns that the applications that are successful in the sense we've got the big applications that the team can reasonably work with and, and evolve them actually follow those patterns. Uh, and that's what we are trying to enforce. And one of the places where we can kind of sim both simplify the framework and enforce these patterns are life cycle. And um, traditionally, there are a lot of data computation happens in the life cycle fluids. And this is kind of where we start mixing both data concepts and the data concepts. Uh, in the signal-based components, we essentially want to solve those two problems by both limiting number of hooks and also kind of change the data. So 
again, today there are rules for the life cycle books, like how many of them do we have, uh, at what time do we, do they run, and so on. And you know, I like kind of illustrate that there are rules and that they are uh, probably sometimes not easy to follow. Like who knows? Uh, hey, Alex, uh, I've got a question for you. Because it's on Angular Dev. No, no, no. Wait. Like, <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, so that that's the thing. Like, I honestly, I actually don't know which one runs first. I think, well, I would have NGO changes, but like, I don't know. So, as Alex is saying, like, there, there is probably the answer is somewhere in the documentation. Uh, and you know, between all those uh, lifecycle hooks that we got, there is probably somewhere indication of the order. And as much as we love our new documentation, um, and we can find the answers there. Probably the best way of of kind of dealing with the complexity is actually eliminating it altogether. Uh, like if we could actually look at the lifecycle hooks and uh, kind of look into use cases where they are mostly mostly used, we could see that most of the lifecycle hooks that are linked to change detection can be really replaced with the simple concept of computing. So again, this is one more um, one more indication of where we want to look at the framework and try to find this new set of concepts and slowly start replacing them with small fundamental com composable pieces. Now uh, we talk about uh, data flow and state management, and uh, if we go back to this pattern of interaction, that data derivation or computation and then finally change detection. That's probably, again, the pattern that you might be familiar with this because many state management libraries are enforcing this for you, and that's good. Uh, so now are we going to take a state management uh, libraries job? Well, not because uh, obviously state management uh, libraries do more for you. They can orchestrate data fetching, they deal with the errors when the data fetching fails and so on and so forth. Uh, so instead of taking the job, we are actually partnering uh, with the uh, major state management libraries. Uh, and uh, when we were starting to introduce signals, we were uh, very early engaging to make sure that um, existing ecosystem works with the new reactive primitive. And I think we are very happy to see that at this point, uh, most state management libraries either publish RFCs or actually published uh, libraries. <laughs> and uh, you should join Marco Talk uh, in a sec and just to hear about that. Uh, we also start to see um, state management solutions from the community, from like from parts of the JavaScript community that are not traditionally part of Angular community. And uh, recently we had like TanStack query adapter for Angular. That's completely different. Um, approach from the like kind of different different from the traditional state management that is mostly based on RxJS. And speaking about RxJS, like I think we're seeing some shift to signals, and the, you know there is a question like what's the like place of RxJS in the uh, in the entire architecture. And the way we look at, at it is that it's a very powerful tool that has many usages for advanced data fetching or data orchestration projects. But also, it kind of got promoted to a tool that you almost have to use. If you look at the, uh, there are many websites that are trying to kind of do a roadmap of how, how do you learn the framework. RxJS is very uh, close to the top. And, Again, that there is this disconnect between we've got very powerful tool that is super useful in certain scenarios, but should we reach for this power from the start? And I think we are trying to evaluate this and uh, potentially kind of push it down a bit in the, in the learning. So that's about state management. Um, the other part where we want to improve uh, developer experience uh, is the friction around authoring form. And Probably, um, you know, um, the all the authoring format questions are probably one of the spices in the community. There are many takes, um, and you know, someone's like, "Hey, don't forget about the state management thing. Just let's go to uh, functional components." Uh, and and again, the, there are many many spicy takes uh, with many like you know different spice level. 
I'm just always saying that um, the easiest way to animate the uh, discussion in the Angular community is to say like, oh, let's rep replace uh, classes with functions, or maybe let's introduce GSX uh, uh, in Angular. And it's kind of you know amusing for us because uh, that's not how we think about those problems. It's really about eliminating friction, right? Like it's going back to this corporate mandate, like oh, I need to create the engine model or I need to create, like we want to remove all those uh, all those friction points. Um, so how how can we do this? When the, there are a few things we actually can do. Uh, we can try to eliminate boilerplate, like just kind of make you write this code without losing ability to understand what's going on or even improving uh, it. So let's look at some of the examples here. So again, we are all developers. We love writing code. This is what we are paid for. Um, and, you know, we kind of also ask to write components like this. There's quite a bit of things going on here. And it might be a bit hard to see, but this is a simple if else statement uh, around some DOM. So let's try going with the Alex, you know, idea of the crystal ball. Like how can we improve this code so that in the future? Well, some of it is not really crystal ball because we introduced the uh, a new control flow, which allows us to replace the star syntax and the ng template with uh, something like this. So at least hopefully the if and else is kind of invisible here. But there's still quite a bit going on here. So let's whoop, let's experiment some more. If we if we look at the references to other components in our templates, we kind of see uh, that we need to import a component twice and kind of reference it by two names. We've got both selector and the actual class name. Uh, I need to import the class name in two places and so on and so forth. That's probably the spices take here. But what if uh, we look, uh, you know, in some kind of streamlined syntax where I can directly reference a class. Again, this is not fully designed. This is not uh, that we will introduce the code without going through the RFC process, but something certainly that we are thinking about. Okay, so assuming that we do something like that, uh, there we've got this standalone and signal through that kind of, you know, that maybe we can do those default ones. Uh, so why do we, why do I have to write it all the time? So let's delete those. I hope it's only mildly spicy at this point. Um, and finally, we've got this slight annoyance where I have to uh, um, have an enum uh, expose as the property of a component because the only thing I can access in the component template is the property of a component. So many solutions here, but like you know, potentially I could have some convention of referencing uh, JavaScript or module scope from, um, from a co component. So now we kind of did a um, few steps. We started from here and we ended up here, which is probably kind of dramatic difference, but we took uh, very small and measured steps, right? Like instead of all the steps on the trivial, and that's kind of really how we think about the algorithm format. It's not like we want to change everything. We want to look at those friction points and kind of address them individually, uh, uh, step by step. The best part of this is that those all those things are really mostly um, easy to automate because we've got a compiler that understands the current templates and can translate them. Cool. The other thing that we can improve by looking at the authoring format is actually designing about what's going on in your template. So another quiz time, hey Alex, or the, you know, uh, all the Angular community, how many directives do we have here in this template? Who thinks there's less than five? <laughs> Alex. <laughs> So like I think we've got like ng model is probably a directive, right? Maybe required, like two, more than five. Okay, who thinks that there is more than five? Okay, okay, Con conflicting messages. So and and that's kind of the point, right? Like it's not super clear. 
Uh, and it cannot be super clear. In fact, there are like, what, seven? Seven, or, yeah, seven, yeah. Seven, seven different directives that are mapping in this template. And many of them are not obvious, right? And that's kind of become the problem with standalone components because you are asked to import things that you are using in a template. So if you don't know what's going actually what's going on in the template, it's hard to import them. So that's kind of you know touching up on forms, and um, this is one of the kind of projects that we want to work on to improve the situation here. But also um, forms are like really uh, the great target for making the framework speak to in signals like validity state is the form touch. Those are really signals in nature. So we probably want to introduce more of those uh, in the forms. As we do this, you know, there is opportunity for looking at the uh, two form systems that we've got. We've got template driven forms, we've got uh, reactive forms. Should we have two systems? Especially that under the hood, there is really just one form system. It's just exposed us to. Uh, again, crystal ball. Testing is another area where we kind of, as we go to, to zone less, uh, we are hitting this point where testbed assumes a lot of bound boundaries. We have to uh, call like fake assings or detect things in the right points of time. This is not all, always obvious when you do it. Similarly, the API design is very framework internal centric. Right? Like this is what in this example here. We really want to replace one of the components in the template with the test component, but the API to do this is kind of very technical. So if you look at those examples, really uh, we are saying, okay, hey, it's always give us supporting to do like the testing API. But, um, but it's really what we are doing here. We are looking at those all those parts of the framework and take it opportunistic, um, you know, like look at them and like, oh, hey, maybe we should change something here. Cool. So those are like immediate plan. Uh, we've got some more things going on for the team. Uh, so I want to kind of briefly touch upon three initiatives uh, that are probably not very visible, but might be very impactful in the future. First of all, there is a TC39 track to standardize signals and Angular is part of it. Uh, we are prototyping actively. Uh, you know, that's a super interesting discussion. We've got all the framework autos there. I don't know where it's going to end, but um, it's very, uh, very interesting discussions. Uh, same CSS animations. We actually kicked off um, the um, spec to kind of make um, elements removal animatable. I don't know if it's the word for CSS. Uh, we'll see where it goes, uh, but, uh, you know, that's potential improvement here. Uh, few transitions, uh, another kind of specifications in the works, it actually landed in the router already before it is fully finalized in the specifications of the browser's implementations. Um, so lots of changes, both like short in the immediate future, like both changes that happen, the changes that we are planning. And, you know, the, there are, those are changes, but, um, uh, I hope like most of them are not surprising because they were either part of our roadmap or up out part of our roadmap. And again, we both do those changes because we do value your time and energy. But we also kind of, I don't know, approaching those changes responsibly because uh, all the changes that we are doing to the system, we kind of feel the pain firsthand because we are in charge of maintaining or migrating all the Google applications. So if we introduce a new, new feature or new change to the framework, we need to both weigh the benefits by the cost of the migration. So in a way, we like the same as we value your time and energy, we absolutely kind of value our, our time and energy because we know that we will go through the same migration. And again, like the, we kind of, um, confident in those steps because again we've got the power of ng update but we also seen that uh the, our rfc process works very well that you actually coming back to us and are giving us very good and very detailed feedback on what should be implemented and what should be implemented 
So we've got a very strong voice in the Angular community, but we actually you've got a very strong voice outside of Angular community. You can actually, I think, uh, we're part of the team. Uh, there is, you know, potential call to action. You can actually go to uh, like existing surveys and let you know the world know about the framework that you use and what what, what is good there. So as the one and closing remark, we really all in it together. Thank you. Cool. Works? Yeah. Okay, do you hear me? Perfect. So um, just one thing. So later on, we will have a panel and we will discuss and do questions of, with the speakers. And if you want to interact with them, just join at uh, spider.com with this code or the QR code so you can post questions and feedbacks, okay? So I'll leave this here for a few minutes. And uh, now we're making uh, miking uh, uh, Marco, and so we'll go on um, with next talk. Okay. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, NGRX Signal Store. NGRX Signal Store is a new state management library for Angular uh, that provides first class support uh, for Signal. But more specifically, I will talk about the journey for, uh, that took almost one year from the initial idea, let's say, to the first official release of NGRX Signal Spec. And before we start, let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Marko Stanimilovic. I come from Belgrade, from Serbia. Uh, I work as a principal front-end engineer at SMG. And besides that, I'm a core member of NGRX team, Google developer expert in Angular, and I'm organizer of Angular Belgrade group. You can find me on Twitter by using my handle at MarkoSTTEV. So the first question for today is, what is signals, NGRX signals for? And at least by definition, we can say that NGRX Signal Store is a reactive state management solution that provides first class or native support for Angular signals. It's built with some key principles in mind. The first goal, let's say, was to make this state management solution simple and intuitive, provide straightforward APIs. Uh, the second principle is to have lightweight and performance library. So based on used APIs from the NGRX signals package, uh, it, well, the participation in the final, final bundle is from 500 bytes to uh, two kilobytes. We also want to make a declarative. So to define our state management logic in a declarative way. Uh, NGRX signal store is also modular, extensible, and scalable. We'll see later by using uh, NGRX Signal Store APIs, we are able to build uh, the independent building blocks that can be reused together or reused separately for building uh, scalable and flexible implementations. Yeah, it's flexible, 
not opinionated in the same time. We try to find some kind of sweet spot uh, to enable customization where needed, but also to have a thoughtful uh, convention to how interesting also APIs should be used. And it's also built with a strong fo uh, focus on type safety. So let's now see how we can create a signal store. Uh, Azure Signals package exposes this signal store function. And this function acts very similar to the RxJS pipe. So RxJS pipe accepts a sequence of RxJS operators where signal store function accepts a sequence of signal store feature. And it returns a service, a dynamic service as a result. So as I told you, we can compose different signal store features in order to build a signal store. And the first very important base feature is with state. And we use this feature to add state slices to our signal store. So we can call with state and then pass the initial state as an input argument. Uh, the next base feature is with computed and we use with computed in order to add computed state to our store, of course. But you can notice one interesting thing here. So as a input argument of with computed feature, we are providing, a, let's say, callback or factory function. And this factory function as an input argument accepts previously defined state slices. So when your signal store will automatically create signals for each state slice. We don't need to do that manually. So we can now use to do the signal that is created by the signal store based on the initial state and define computed state. In this case, we define completed to do And the last or third, it's not actually the last, we have one more, but the third base feature is with methods. And you can guess probably, right? We are using with methods to add uh, methods to our store. In this case, I added add, add to do. And to update the state, there is a patch state function. So it's a standalone function that accepts a store as a first and sequence of partial states or updater functions as rest argument. We'll see that later in more details. So now if we want, as I told you, a signal store function returns a dynamic service. And we can now provide this service where needed. For example, we can provide it at the component level if we want to manage the local state. Then we can inject our store and use it as any other service. But let's hold up a little bit and try to go back to the beginning of the story in order to understand how we ended up with this design, how we ended up with development experience that Signal Store provides. So I worked a lot with NGOX Component Store. Who used NGOX Component Store so far? Can you raise your hand? Okay, not too much. Cool. But I faced uh, a lot of limitations actually with with NGOX Component Store, and these limitations are not related to Component Store itself. They are related to any, let's say, class-based state management solution. The first one was typing, so it's not possible to define. A dynamic class properties or methods that are strongly typed. Why we need this? For example, for the, in case of the signal store, we pass when we extend the base. Uh, in case of the component store, sorry, when we extend the component store class, we pass the initial state to the parent class reconstructor. But then, what we are usually doing, we are manually creating a selector for each state slice. But we actually don't need to do that. We can do that automatically, so component store can generate that these selectors automatically based on the initial state. But the problem is typing. We are not able to uh, add properties or methods to our class in a dynamic way and have strongly typed the base class. The next problem is tree shaking, of course. If you're not using Google Closure compiler, then unused class methods won't be removed from the final bundle, right? And the next problem is extensibility. So multiple inheritance is not supported. I mean, it's supported, but it's not out of the box supported. So uh, the problem is, uh, in case of Component Store, for example, there are some community plugins for the Component Store. We have Entity Component Store that provides some entity helpers 
as a part of the base class. We have eMore component store that gives us the ability to update component store state in a mutable way, but immutably. And the problem is we can use them together, right? Because in a JavaScript or TypeScript, we can only inherit a single class. Uh, the last problem is modularity. So splitting selectors, subdaters, and effects into different classes is possible, right? But it's not provided out of the box in the case of component store. So if we have a large component store, it's not that easy to split different building blocks into separate files, let's say. And then in uh, February this year, I, I was thinking, okay, how we can improve this? Is there a way to uh, to increase, to make a better development experience with Component Store and also to solve these limitations? And then I open this uh, RFC. Uh, it says add create Component Store function. So this RFC basically proposed to add a function that gives us the ability to create Component Store in a functional way. And let's quickly see how it looks like. So, uh, this is actually the initial inspiration for the signal store. Uh, there is a create component store function that also returns a dynamic service and it accepts a config object with two required properties. The first one is initial state and the second one is a factory. So you can see the signature is very similar to the Angular's injection token signature, actually. Uh, so for the factory, as an input argument, we will already get all the utility that Component Store provides. Select, effect, patch state, set state, et cetera. We are now able, instead of the factory, of course, to inject the service if needed, and then define selectors, effects, updaters, and in the end, the result to return all the properties and methods that needs to be part of the public API. We are now also able to move our for example, selectors and effects into separate functions and then use them inside of the factory or the component store. So this solution compared to the class-based component store is extensible. If we talk about modularity, it's supported, but still out of the box, it's not because it still needs some manual work to make it work. Typing is now great. Now we are able to, based on the initial state, to create selector for each component store property and provide it as an input argument of the factory function. But we still have a problem with tree shaking, right? Because uh, as an input argument of factory, we need to provide all the utilities of the component store. So then I was thinking, okay, how we can improve this initial prototype? Should we make some component store methods standalone? That was the first question. But breaking changes were not the option, right? Because component store, I'm not sure if you know, uh, is the second most popular state management solution in Angular, at least based on MPM downloads right after the NGREX store. So breaking changes are not the option. The second question was, OK, but should we then ensure backward compatibility? But that would lead to duplicated APIs. We will have several APIs that does the same thing, which can lead to confusion. And the last question was, OK, should we provide a different set of utilities for functional component store? So to keep component store, class-based component store as it is, and then introduce a different APIs, let's say, different utilities for the functional component store. But that would again lead to confusion because we will have inconsistent APIs. And then I was thinking, okay, should we make a compromise? Should we uh, go with the initial proposal, even if we are uh, aware of all its limitations, let's say, even if we're able to solve these limitations, but that would introduce a different set of problems, right? And then a few days later, uh, Alex uh, from the Angular team uh, posted this RFC, uh, or so the yeah, it was discussion on GitHub about Angular activity with signals. And to be honest, I was aware of that Angular team is playing around with signals for some time. But when I saw this RFC, uh, I realized okay, they are they are really uh, serious about this, and this will most likely end up as a part of the core framework. 
So then I ask myself, okay, do we need another state management solution? And the answer was, yeah, definitely. We need another state management solution that that solves the limitations that other existing state management solution have, but we also need another state management solution that provides a native support for new reactive primitive in the Angular framework. And then one or two weeks later, I created a prototype for the NGRX signal store that was later called NGRX signals as a package and opened the RFC uh, in the NGRX repository to collect the community feedback. And okay, let's now see how signal store works. So I prepared a, a demo. By the way, you can find it here on my GitHub profile. Uh, this is the repository NGRX signal example. So you can find it here. We'll now see how it works in action. So we'll start with a simple example. We'll try to build a counter store. Here you can see what we want to display. We want to display a count, double count, and we want to have increment and decrement actions. So I will go here uh, to counter store, and let's try to create a signal store. We need to export a constant, let's call it counter store, and say this is a signal store. So you can see we need to import the signal store from the NGRX signals package. And as we saw in the example from the slides, we now need to pass the sequence of signal store features in order to build the signal store. So here we'll start with with state and add count zero as the initial state. The next thing that we need is a double count. So I'll use with computed, which is a short for with computed state. That the set factory function, and as an input argument of the factory function here, we can destructure it and see that signal store provides a signal count, so the property count, which is type of signal number based on our initial state. If I, if we add something else here, if I say x1 like this, then we will also have x as a signal here. So let's remove this. We need a count in order to create the double count, right? So we can define double count here. Use computed and return count multiplied by two, like this. And the next thing, our increment and decrement method. So use with methods. With methods also sets a factory function. So here we can access all previously defined signals uh, that are state slices actually and derived or computed signals. So I will need count here so we can define two methods. I want to define increment and decrement. I will immediately return it so we can say increment like this. And to update the state, we need to use the patch state function from the NGRX signals package. As a first argument, it accepts uh, the reference to the store. And as a rest argument, we are able to pass the sequence of partial state or updater functions. So the first option can be we can grab the entire store instance here and pass it as an input argument to the pet state and then update the increase the count by using the updater function, for example. So we can take the count here, say result is count count plus one. This is the first option. For the decrement, let's try something else. Let's try to use a partial object. So we can pass the store as a first, and here I want to say count is equal to existing uh, current count value plus minus one, actually. To do that here, we can do the following. So I can destructure the count and say that the store is the rest. So now we can say here, count plus minus one, like this. That's it. And the last base feature that we didn't saw so far is called with hooks. And it gives us the ability to add lifecycle hooks to the signal store. So I can use with hooks here 
and we have two hooks. We have on in it that will be executed with single stories initialized and on destroy that will be executed with single stories destroyed, of course. On in it also accepts it has a store as an input argument. So we can now, if we want, we can say, um, for example, something like this interval. So what I want to do every two seconds, I want to increment the value, the count value. So we can say use the interval, then say pipe take until destroyed like this, dot subscribe, and then we want to call store dot increment like this. And you can notice one more important thing here, namely uh hooks of the signal store are executed inside of the injection context. So we can use take until destroyed here, for example. For on destroy, let's say something like this. Let's take only the, the count you know, and log its value. So we can say count on destroy and log the count value like this. Let me check the terminal. Okay, we can. We can call the ng serve and the next step that we need to do is actually to use the counter store inside of the counter component. So first thing I want to have this store as a local store for the counter components we need to provide it. I will add the counter store here to the provider's array of counter component. And then we need to inject it, right? So we can say Read only store is equal to inject counter store like this. If you're wondering if we're, is it possible to use constructor based dependency injection? Yeah, it's possible. You can find in the examples how we can use constructor based dependency injection uh, with signal store as well. Uh, the next thing is to use uh, store API. So we can say store.count here. Here we need to use store dot double count, and for increment button we want to say uh, store dot increment and store dot decrement, right? Like this. Okay, let's click on save. See if it works. Um, so, let's see what's the problem. Okay, here it is. Uh, so this is the first example, as you can see, it works. And you can also notice that every two seconds, the uh, value count is increased because we set uh, the interval inside of the one in hook for the counter store here. Okay, next example that I want to show you is also the, the example with counter. And here we have the Again, the counter store uh, with hooks part is a different, but the thing that I want to show you is this part here. So if we set provided in root as a first argument of the signal store function, then this store will be provided at the root level, the singleton. And when it comes to modularity and extensibility that we talked about, I will show you how we can now create uh, custom features in our application. What if, for example, we want to use count, uh, double count, increment, and decrement in multiple stores? How we can do that without repeating ourselves? So let's now see how, how we can do this with a single store. I will cut this and go to the counter feature.ts file, which is empty currently, so we can create a new feature, we will call it with counter, like this, export function. Then I will return and I'll use a new function that we didn't saw so far, it's called signal store feature, but it works in the same way as signal store. It also sets a sequence of base or custom features. So we can now just paste, we can now just paste, uh, uh, with state, with computed, and with method. So how it works. Now, if we use with counter, 
into another store into, or another custom feature, it will add count state slice, it will add a double count computed signal and increment and decrement methods. Let's now see if it works. So here, inside of the counter store, we can say with counter, like this. And now you can see that we don't have a compilation error anymore, so double count is available here. If we uh, inspect what properties are provided by the with counter feature, you can see that we now have double count, we have count, increment, as well as decrement method. So this is the way how we can define a custom feature. The next thing that is very important is actually DirectJS integration, because For the signal store, RxJS is an optional dependency, and this is, I think, the final goal of the Angular framework as well. So we already have this with, with the signal store, but where, what should we do when it comes to some more complex asynchronous side effects? RxJS is still very good for that. So I will now, we now have a user store example. And what we want to do, so here we want to, uh, as a part of the initial state, we have an array of users, is loading flag and query. And we want to fetch users from the API every time with query is changed, right? So here I will add, uh, let's first add a simple load all method. So I want to show you how we can perform a side effect without RxJS with signal store. So what we can do here, we first need to patch our state and set the is loading to true. That's the first step. The next step is to actually fetch users from the API. And for that, we need to inject the user service. We can inject user service here. So I can say user service is equal to inject users service. Then we can say const users is equal to await and then call user service dot get all. And by the way, get all returns the promise. So we can use async await if we want. And the next step is to say patch state store pass the users and set is loading to false. So this is how we can implement load all. It's very simple, right? But if we want to implement load by query, then we can take advantage of using RxJS. So I will define a new uh, method here. I'll call it load by query. And to define reactive methods with signal store, we can use a function called Rx method. And this Rx method is provided uh, from the you can see here from the sub package and direct signal slash RxJS interrupt. It actually returns the reactive method. We will see in a few seconds that can accept the signal observable or static value as an input argument. And it will always run the chain of RxJS operator that are implemented. So here, by the way, Rx method, if you're familiar with component store, Rx method is actually the component store dot effect. It has the same signature. So here, as a generic argument, we want to define what's the input. Let's say that input is string, because query is type of string. And then here, I will use RxJS pipe to chain RxJS operators that I want to use here. So we can say, uh, for example, uh, the bounce time 300. Then we can use distinct until changed. Then we want to use a switch map. We will get a query here as an input argument and call uh, user service dot get by query and pass the query as an input argument. Then here we want to pipe the response and uh, based on the, if we got the success, we want to, uh, for example, add the users to the, to the store if we got the error, we want to display that error. So for that purpose, we can use the top response operator. That is actually the top, but under the hood, it also has the catch error empty. So if the error happens, our observable, our subscription will be still alive. 
So here on the next event, we will get the users. So I want to set, I want to call patch state and set users, but also to set these loading to false like this. For error, I want to do console dot error. It should be fine. We also have another callback here. We can use finalize if we want to set store is loading to false. So we can now remove is loading from here. And finalize will be executed in case of error or next. So in both cases, we want to set this loading to false. So here, I also want to call the tab because we forgot to set is loading to true. Patch state store is loading true like this. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Now we need to call this load by query method. Rx method is like a factory. It returns a function or method that can be called. So for that, we can use with hooks because when this signal store is initialized, what I want to do, I want to call this load by query. I want to pass the query signal as an input argument. And what will happen under the hood, this logic here will be re-executed every time when that signal emits a new value. So we can also destructure here. We can take the load by query and query signal and call load by query, pass the query signal as an input argument. So as I told you, this is query is a signal, as we can see here. So this load by query method, actually this logic here, will be re-executed every time when query signal value changes. Let's now save this and see if it works. So there is another uh, tab here, ArcGIS integration. So yeah, when I type John, for example, you can see that it works and the loading flag is also displayed properly. Okay, the last example, we will not dive deep into it, but I just want to show you that Signal Store provides another plugin for the entity management. So here I define the to-do store and this plugin provides a custom feature called with entities. So when we use with entities, uh, this feature will automatically add the entity map, array of IDs and entities array as a computed uh, state to our store. So here you can see we can use with methods and add some uh, methods for entity manipulation. We can add entity, remove entity or update entity. So this add, remove, so all these updaters, entity updaters are exposed by the entity sub package. But compared to NGREX entity package, if you used it before, you can notice that they are standalone which means that they are tree shakeable. So only the updaters that we use will end up in our final bundle. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, another thing, yesterday I, I checked the NPM and we reached the first milestone. So less than two weeks since we released the NGREX signals package, we reached uh, the 1000 weekly downloads. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I also want to mention that NGREX Signal Store is inspired by some other state management solutions and libraries. It's inspired by NGREX Store, by NGREX Entity, by Component Store. It's also inspired by RxJS. So you can see that Signal Store, as I mentioned, it works similar to RxJS Pipe. It's, if we take a look at the patch state function, it, it has the very similar signature that Rx function from RxJS8 has. So it accepts a store as the first and sequence of updaters or partial states as rest arguments. It's also inspired by ELF, Nginit ELF state management library, and it's also inspired by uh, Vue.js Pinia. I worked a lot with Vue.js in the last couple of months, by the way. I also want to say big thanks to these amazing people. So my team members from the NGREX team, Tim Deschreiber, Brandon Roberts, Alex Okrushko. I also want to say big thanks to Gabriel, 
to friends from the Angular Architects team, Reiner, Manfred, and Michael, and also to my former manager, Phil Bonneau, who was probably the first beta tester of the NGRX Signal Store. Um, yeah, if you want to follow us, you can do that on uh, Twitter or X, how it's called right now, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also join the Discord server, so discord.gg slash NGRX. If you want, if you have any question, we can help you there. Or if you want to help other community members, that's also a great way to contribute to the community. Uh, our official docs, NGRX.io, we also have the official blog, dev2 slash NGRX. And I also want to announce that we uh, will, that NGRX team will conduct two workshops. Uh, the first is in January for the US base time. The second one is uh, February for the European base time. You can find more info on this link, Tito slash NGRX. Uh, if you want to take a look at our source code or if you want to contribute, you can visit our NGRX mono repo, so github.com slash NGRX slash platform. And that's it from my side for today. Thank you very much for attention. <laughs>
uh, we use a lot of uh, like uh, surveys and trying to distill like, data from many sources and kind of try to aggregate uh, yeah. and, and so on. So there is like, it's not like one say like, oh, this is just like well-defined part. There's just like so many, uh, so many things. And I guess like the, the best way for me to describe it like, is just talk to us. Like we are trying to really be available and kind of approachable just because we know that we are not writing applications on the daily basis, you are writing applications and kind of you know more what's needed. I think we can just kind of, we need to meet in the middle and just kind of from our knowledge of the internals of the framework, meet you with the units of the applications. Uh, I don't know, probably. Yeah, just like everything Pavel said, first of all, um, talking about kind of the pace of change, right? And like we're, you know, Clearly we're tackling, so we're aiming at some big problems. Um, we see some big opportunities, but how quickly we can roll those out and, and how much we can kind of change an individual version is something that's hotly debated. Um, and it, it, what it really comes down to is like, we have ng update and ng update as a tool is very useful, but it has limitations. We can't, for example, just rewrite all components to signals through ng update. And even if we could, you know, we would roll that out in a version and then you wouldn't understand how your application works anymore. Right? We can migrate the code. We can't really migrate your brain that well. So we spend a lot of time yet. We, we spend a lot of time thinking, yeah. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about kind of what the impact of any given change is and when the right moment to make that change is and what changes it makes sense to pair it with. Uh, and one of the tools we've been leaning on a lot more in recent projects for this is user research. So for control flow, for example, we did kind of formal studies of looking at the different options and syntax and which ones developers found more intuitive and more readable and more writable. Uh, and that ultimately went into kind of informing the actual decisions that were made. Uh, we did the same with signals. Even before we announced signals publicly, we were running studies um, with actual community members, both inside and outside of the Angular community, under trying to understand kind of the impact on their mental model of how you write applications of what this change would be. Um, so that's something I think we're, we're learning as we go along and as we start taking aim at bigger things, um, kind of how to manage that process. And it's absolutely not something where we want to be kind of top down um, about. It's a conversation we want to have with our community on when the right times to make these changes are. Uh, a good example of this is standalone, right? Standalone became the default largely because people started asking us, hey, why is it not? Yeah, why is it not the default? Um, we might reach a point soon where people will start asking us, why is the standalone flag still there? Why is this not just automatic? Um, so often a lot of these changes come from you, our community. Thank you, but I promise not to change the forms uh, for the audience. Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, it, it, I, I, will, I like the fact that you, you know you guys are here united because it, everything in packet most of our libraries. And so, yeah, um, what I would like you uh, to you, Marco, is that um, you did, of course, in very very smaller sides, but a, a similar path. So you had to push changes to a library that would make impact. Um, I mean, coming from two directions, the framework itself but also you wanted to please your users, right? And I think you did the great work because you showed something that simplified a lot. And uh, I, I used something and now I see that, yeah, now I can definitely teach somebody to, to make it very easy uh, to use it, right? So um, what do you think uh, are, apart from your experience, the reason for you to change your library, of course, apart from, you know, a big change making to the, to the framework. So how would you like to, you know, you and your team make it better um, in the next future. Yeah, so as you, as you said, uh, NGRX signals provides, we saw that it provides different approach to state management compared to component store or NGRX store. And it was not that easy to make a decision to go with another state management solution, of course, because both store and components are widely used across the, uh, the Angular ecosystem. Uh, but as I mentioned in my talk, uh, the main reason uh, why we decided to go with a separate state management solution was to solve the limitations of the previous ones, but also to provide a state management solution that has native support for new reactive primitive from the Angular framework. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, I'll go with um, most voted questions that we received on Slido. And uh, this one is for, uh, for you guys for, uh, and it's on SSR. So um, the thing is that, is the SSR streaming being researched, designed only for fully sites-based zoneless application or are zone-based apps staying in game here? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so we've we've done um, some research into streaming. We built some prototypes around streaming. Um, those prototypes were based on zones, so they're absolutely still continuing to work with the the previous reactivity model. For streaming, it's not necessarily like when to run change detection that's the problem. The main challenge is knowing which components are kind of already done and don't need any further change detection, won't be updating their state at any point in the future. So it's much more on the kind of what's affected by any given change and not like when that change is happening. Um, so it's largely independent of whether you're zone full or zoneless in an application. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have a question for you, Marco. Um, will component store become deprecated or are there any benefits of using it compared to Signal store? Component store, yeah. Yeah, so component store won't be deprecated. We, there is no plan to deprecate store or component store. They will be still maintained and improved over time because they're widely used. But we will try to uh, not, so as I mentioned, breaking changes were not an option. Um, so we are trying to follow the, the same uh, path that as Angular team does, so to have the breaking changes at some minimum level, let's say, if you use, I don't know, RX, NGRX version 8 and NGRX version 17, there are almost no breaking changes. And we try to, to go into that direction in the future as well. And another question for you guys is, uh, what are um, the current and future plans for supporting mutable data structures in signals? How is it that relates to change detections? Yeah, this tough one. Well, it's actually not the, that tough one. So, so I think we, um, it's kind of, may, maybe let's start by acknowledging that like introducing signals into the framework is a big step for, for us and for community, right? Like uh, the framework was designed with this idea of uh, that you can use any day JavaScript data structure, like mutate it anywhere you want and however you want, and the framework will do like through zone GS uh, the right thing. And that that's works has like great DX in cases, but like it also has limitations. And so what we saw over time that even if you know like the, the DX of zone GS is great, like most of the community or like large parts of the community went into more reactive way of doing things based on RxJS, right? Like, so there was this always this kind of disconnection between like how framework was designed and how it is used. And I think for us, that was the moment where we kind of want to reconcile these things. We like those reactive patterns, but we kind of know that the framework needs to be updated and it will take time, right? Like, so that's why we started with the, okay, let's have the smallest reactive primitive that like people like Marco can build on top and, and create a story. Like, I mean, story is the perfect example of something like a bigger data structure that can be updated uh, by patching it in kind of almost like a mutable state. Now, uh, should we, like, how should we expand things uh, in the framework? I think we mostly want to have a very solid integration of the signals into the framework, right? Like we want to make sure that uh, when you update the signal, like the UI is updated, it's always consistent, it's performant. Uh, we want to make sure that you can consume signals from the framework, that inputs are there, queries are there, the forms work with signals and so on and so forth. Um, there's the, then there's a question uh, kind of in order, of, maybe not in order of priorities, but like kind of in order of importance for us is that like, okay, how do we work with the bigger data structures? Uh, and there's an open question, should we solve this problem? Um, or should it be solved by the community? Um, as Alex mentioned, we are working with the, like our sister team with Wiz and they actually also thinking of the similar problems. So maybe we actually have, will have a solution by like not dying by us. So there are many, many, many things there. Now, I guess coming back to this precise question of the mutable data structures and so on, we kind of go, went back from like, yes, signals have to, don't mutate to now like, let's go to uh, immutable. So we kind of went all the way uh, on the stricter side for the like to stabilize APIs, but we kind of hear the feedback that like, okay, many people like the pattern 
and we are thinking actively of kind of enabling it and, and bringing it back. But it takes time to kind of think through the consequences of it. Yeah. So we just don't want to rush it. Um, staying on the concept of mutability and things, you have a question for you, but um, uh, I've, I mean, we've seen people using email libraries or things for, you know, making changes uh, precisely, right? And uh, so uh, the question is that is patch state doing something similar to what you usually do with email libraries? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, so um, patch state doesn't use uh, under the hood email. Uh, so we need to care, take care about uh, providing immutable updates, but it's possible to integrate uh, patch state with Emer. Um, in the next couple of months, probably we will add. Uh, there is a community plugin called Angerx Emer. If you heard about that, and it, it provides utilities for Emer uh, and for component store and store. So we, in that package, we will probably provide a new function. It will be called Emer Patch State or something like that that will give us the ability to update the signal store state in a mutable way, immutably. I see. Thanks. And last question is um, for you guys, is can we expect Angular team to prepare some guidance for structuring data flow with signals to follow best practices? So I think it's more like, you know, documentation and examples. Um, so the short answer is yes. So, uh, I mean, honestly, um, I think, I mean, I don't want to say that it was a surprise to me, but it was a definitely eye-opening experience to kind of start playing with signals and uh, generally speaking with state management is that a lot of effort goes into like learning signals is easy, right? Like there are like free, free primitives, like the API surface is very, very simple. What is not easy is actually thinking about how to structure the application. And I think there is absolutely uh, a lot of guidance needed. Um, I think there is an, like, I don't want to say that we just want to solve it for everyone, right? Like in the sense, like we will kind of go to our cave somewhere and like uh, on the conference, probably next year in Rome, we will announce the new uh, state management solution that works for everyone and solves everything. I think it will be iterative process. And we really, uh, we lean on those partnerships. Um, uh, I don't know, like I don't probably give away too many secrets by saying that we've got very regular meetings with the all state management library, like maybe not all, but like with many state management library authors, and we're kind of trying to work on those uh, problems hand in hand. But uh, just to summarize, I think we absolutely recognize that that data flow or like how like like seen uh, as the entire uh, you know flow from user action to the server side data fetching, handling errors, and updating the UI. This is a hard part, and we absolutely think that uh, the framework or the ecosystem around the framework could definitely help here more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think we are. Uh, I mean, we have a last minute questions. If we can answer that in thirty seconds, top, and that would be awesome. So the thing is that uh, what are the design processes that led the Angular team to the decision of leaving RxJS behind instead of fully adopting in a score of the framework, which is I know, uh, yeah. Controversy. Yeah, yeah uh, 30 seconds, okay. Um, I don't know if there was necessarily like a, a, you know, if we on the team sat down and decided one day that we didn't really want RxJS um, to be a core part of the story, it was more listening to community feedback. We heard kind of two very strong messages. Some part of the community was saying like, we, we value this tool, we think it's amazing, it's really helping us in our applications and we need it to work well with Angular and here are the problems. And some other part of the community was telling us, why are you making me use this thing? I don't wanna learn it, I don't feel it's useful to me. And it was about 50-50. Okay. And so we were like, clearly we got it perfect, right? We're right in the middle. Yeah. Um, and that it was that kind of dichotomy that really led us to the strategy decision of like, okay, let's make RxJS Angular uh, in Angular optional. So it's not a part of the core journey. People don't feel like they have to become RxJS developers before they can become Angular developers, but still give the power and give the ability to tightly integrate this thing to the people who want to use it, who feel like it's benefiting their use cases. So thank you guys. And uh, yeah, I think we are up for the time, of course, uh, but we will continue chatting in coffee break. So yeah. Thank you, guys.
Are you ready? How was the breakfast? <laughs> Second breakfast, of course. Okay, I'm going to introduce uh, Davide Passafaro. Davide is a member of the... Woo! Really warm welcoming. Interesting. Uh, Davide, you have no mi microphone, actually. Try now. Angular, Angular, Angular okay, Angular. <laughs> okay, um, Davide is a member of the community in Rome, uh, Angular Rome. So we organize meet up together each month. So join us if you uh, are around Rome. And uh, we work three years together in the same company, uh, Content.it. So let's welcome Davide and uh, enjoy. Thank you. So thank you to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how to create dynamic forms, uh, dynamic reactive forms uh, starting from an object or a JSON. So uh, it's a kind of an experiment that I made some years ago and I, uh, I wanted to, to do it now with the new, new news, the new fresh uh, APIs and so on. So basically, uh, as uh, front-end developers, uh, uh, we, I think that we uh, mainly do design our application to do two kind of stuff. So show data and ask data to the user. So uh, the second part, uh, ask data to the user, it's basically to build some forms. So we, in our application, we build a lot of forms uh, that uh, ask to the user a lot of data in a different ways. Uh, we also design uh, multiple step forms uh, and with uh, a lot of different status like uh, with validation if uh, a certain field it's uh, it's well filled by the user if it has some errors uh, and so on so uh, this is usually this is uh, one of the most exciting part of the development nope no it's not so usually it's something so stressful it's something that could be challenging. It's something that could be annoying uh, based also on the requirement that could be sometimes too much uh, uh, strange uh, or they can change uh, a lot of times. Uh, but since we uh, are in this conference, I guess that everybody of you work with Angular. And uh, since Angular is probably the best framework uh, uh, all the time, uh, we have a lot of, we have two tools that Angular provide us. The first one are the template-driven forms. They are a tool that uh, enable us to uh, uh, connect and bind a certain variable to the template and add some validators. They are a lot integrated with the template, so they are a lot dependent from the template. Then we have the reactive forms that uh, uh, basically rely on some classes. And we can bind these classes to the uh, template through some directives. I might say that. Uh, when you learn how to work with reactive forms, uh, you will forget about template-driven forms. Usually, this is the, the way. Reactive forms rely on some classes, as I was saying. The first one is the form group uh, that mimics uh, uh, and wrap uh, uh, an object, basically. Then we have the form control that wrap a, a single property, and the form array that wrap a list of properties. We, in reality, we also have another one that uh, uh, is uh, nearly born uh, to integrate uh, types uh, better with form arrays, uh, that is the form record. But for the sake of this presentation, I will skip this uh, explanation. Basically, so we, we create this, uh, these classes, and thanks, for, thanks to the directives, uh, we are able to bind these uh, classes to the uh, inputs and to the uh, form components. And we can add easily some validators. So for instance, I can have a, a property name that I want to be required, so the user need to fill it. And the classes take the responsibility to validate, to check if, if the properties respect this validation, to check if the status could have changed, so maybe the user interact with that, and so the, the form field is touched, the user changed the value, so maybe it's also dirty instead of being pristine, and so on. And the directives also take charge of uh, appending some classes 
to the uh, component in order to let us uh, use these classes to style our components. And yeah, this is cool. This is super cool. But there is sometimes there could be something that uh, could be challenging. Imagine if we uh, need to change, uh, for instance, uh, the property name. We need to also to go on the template, find all the instances, and change it. This could be maybe not too much difficult in some easy forms, uh, but it could be challenging uh, if you work in an environment where the business needs to uh, keep up with uh, a lot of uh, changing of law requirements, uh, or maybe the business doesn't know if the form is okay, so want to apply a lot of changes, also a bit test and so on. So because of that, uh, uh, some years ago, I was thinking about how to solve this. Uh, I was still a junior developer, so I end up with a solution that was uh, maybe a lot challenging at the time, but I still think it's not a really bad idea. So the general idea is to create something so magical that is able to uh, take a JSON or an object and create my form dynamically. So let me introduce myself briefly. I'm Davide, I'm a senior front-end engineer, and in two days I will start my new, a new adventure in Network. I'm uh, one of the Angular ROM community manager, and I like to complicate my life. So this is the talk is, is just for that. So today we are going to see how I build something to generate dynamic forms. I also made a demo. So at the end of the presentation, I will uh, show you the demo and also the Git repository. So you can go there, comment the code, uh, copy the code. Uh, also so leave me some comments like it's garbage. So what have you done uh, and so on. But I, I, I'd like to confront with you if you if you like. So basically, I start uh, creating uh, uh, the interface of this JSON that uh, will be able to let me generate uh, the form dynamically. I inserted some properties like the type to specify which which is the uh, form field that I want to show, the the key that is the key that uh, I will use. Uh, to insert it in the form group because I'm going to use the for reactive form uh, uh, completely. Then I add something like the default value uh, as optional because maybe I want to uh, generate a form with also some values already filled. Uh, I'm able to show to the user some information like this is the, you need to put your name here. I could also have added also some placeholders, but I jumped for this demo. And also a collection of validators to, of course, append validators to the, the form control. But I already started uh, in a strange way because uh, this is maybe too much generic. So I decided to specify which are the collection of possible types that I want to use. And I start with adding some basic components like an input and a checkbox list. Adding the checkbox list, of course, I would have needed uh, uh, an option uh, collection to fill the, the checkbox uh, uh, options. But at this point, uh, I had an issue. Of course, the input does not require this. So I added uh, it as optional. But in this way, I have another problem because the checkbox uh, need the rem that's that. So it, it's, it's a required field for the checkbox list. So since I'm dealing with some Type skip types, uh, I asked for an app and I, I received this help. So I, I just needed to study. Okay. And that's basically true. Since we are dealing with types, uh, we need to study TypeScript better because TypeScript is really powerful. Java, TypeScript is basically the cooler the JavaScript. So it's, uh, it's JavaScript. You can do everything that you can do with JavaScript, but you also have types. So I ended up doing something like this. So I just created two interfaces, one for the input and one for the checkbox list. They share, they extend a base interface that shares some data like the type and the key. But uh, for instance, for the input, I, I defined that the type should be input and the default value should be string or number. Then uh, for the checkbox, I, I specified, of course, its type, so checkbox list. Then the, the, the option is required. And also that the default value is a collection of strings. And then I use the uh, target union of TypeScript to, uh, uh, a sort of, to do a sort of uh, merge of these interfaces. Uh, essentially, I export a type that says uh, it could be an input control or a checkbox list control. In this way, 
basically TypeScript is able to set to me the correct types. So if I create uh, uh, an interface with type input, uh, he correct uh, cast the correct uh, put the uh, types to the default value. And even uh, if I create a checkbox list, uh, option uh, uh, field is required. So it works like I was expecting. So what can, you, can, can we say since we are here? Thanks, Microsoft, with that build uh, and create uh, uh, TypeScript. But OK, thank you, Glippy, also. So now that we have the basic interface, uh, so we have the, our structure, we have our idea, we need to build our component because, of course, we need to I have a component to render inside the template. So we uh, need to have a design, of course, uh, and, and build our component to be uh, completely able to handle graphically the all possible status of our um, field. So if there is an error, if there is a, the, the, the input is valid, and so on. Uh, and we also need to find a way to integrate the, the component with the form control. So a lot of colleagues like to just pass the for control as an input. I see it as a uh, not really good practice because essentially you will end up for sure uh, implementing something that the directives are able to do if you uh, are able to connect directly the directive with the component. So I prefer to do it. So uh, to design my component to be able to be used directly with the uh, form control directives. And you can basically do it really fast. You just need to provide an instance of the ng value accessor and use the existing class, the class itself of the component as a value. Then you need to implement the control value accessor. So this is the classical example that you will find on the internet. Everybody probably found a tutorial to do a rating component. Implementing the control value accessor, basically we are uh, say we are uh, sure that we are implementing everything that the directive will search inside our component to to connect with the component. So it basically asks us to integrate a write value function. That is what it will be called if you update the value of the form control. So you update the value of the form control, and the component will be notified with this function. Then uh, with the same idea, we have the set disable state. So it will be notified if you uh, disable or enable the component, uh, uh, the, the, the control from the control, uh, the form control itself. Uh, this is also the op only optional of the form methods. Then we have two functions that are the uh, register on change and register on touch. They will provide us two functions that we need to save. And we need to use that function to uh, to inform the uh, form control, the, the form control instance uh, when something has changed. So the user click on the third star and select the, the, the rating as three. We need to use the on change to uh, basically trigger the set uh, inside the form control. And uh, also we, we, do, we need to do the same stuff with the on touch. So the user touched uh, my component. Uh, I can uh, say that the, the user touch it, touch it, so uh, uh, try to use it. Uh, and I will basically use the on touch to uh, trigger the mark as touched function. Uh, this could be a little bit challenging when you start to doing this uh, to understand better when uh, to use the on change and when to use the on touch. Uh, but I suggest you to think about your custom component uh, as a sort of extension of the basic components. So for instance, the rate component is just a collection of radio button, because when you select a rating, you will not have two ratings selected uh, together. And also this one, this is one I, I love this one because I worked uh, for uh, uh, some insurance company and you, you can select which kind, uh, which is the part of the car that you broke during, during an incident. And yeah, it's super cool, but it's basically a collection of checkboxes. So nothing too much strange to, to think about, no? Okay. so. Now that we have uh, the components and we have the structure of our JSON, we need to create the magic, OK? So we can just create a component that will receive an input uh, our configuration collection. Then uh, if you want, uh, and I suggest you to do it, uh, you can uh, put an output to emit the form group as soon as it is created, because maybe you want to uh, connect with some information of the value change uh, uh, in uh, your page. and uh, I will uh, 
see we will see the core part of the implementation it, of course the actual implementation that i did in the demo it's a little bit more complicated but basically the first thing that i i did is to generate the classes dynamically starting from the configuration this is quite easy maybe you uh, can think about uh, how to refactor this with a reduce, but for the sake of the implementation was easier with uh, the for each implementation. So you create a group, uh, you uh, then loop for each uh, of the uh, configuration uh, uh, the collection, and then uh, you see if there is a value, I use it as initial value, otherwise it will be none. I then uh, create a function to uh, generate the validators list, uh, searching it, uh, uh, if the validator is specified inside the validator uh, collection uh, of uh, Angular, or otherwise in a custom map that I created for my custom uh, validators, because I can also use custom validators. And then I just create the, the phone control and add it to, to the form. This is quite easy. Now we are the second step. We need uh, to build uh, the template and to, bond, uh, the, to bind the uh, phone controls to the template. Here we have two two choices. The first one, the blue pill, is maybe the, the simpler one. You can just create a template uh, that uses a for loop, uh, and then uh, uh, as a switch case in it, uh, that selects which is the type of the component, uh, and you directly put the template here. It works, of course. So you totally rely on the phone control uh, uh, directives, uh, but this kind may, can grow really, really uh, uh, in a strange way sometimes. Uh, I did this in the past, and it grows uh, a lot because I had a lot of different types of forms. Of course, uh, since I, I like to complicate my life, uh, I will choose the red one. So the red one is to create everything from scratch dynamically. So the first part is to create the template. And this is quite easy, thanks to the new API of, I think, Angular 13, or more or less, to create the component dynamically. So you have just to... Uh, uh, use the view container ref uh, service, then uh, you can just uh, use the create component method to create your component based on which is the component, of course. And then you put uh, the uh, the um, you can put the the properties uh, uh, inside the component uh, uh, ref itself. I know that the this if statement is not really good, but there are plenty of way to. Uh, optimize it and to write it in a different way, maybe also in a more structured way. So maybe we can think about this as a, something to improve. Uh, and also now that we, we, we will see that uh, now we will have the template generated. So we will have our component graphically there, but we still need to bind it with different controls. So basically we need to uh, connect them together. I try to do some complicated stuff, really cool, maybe to instantiate a, directory, uh, a directive uh, dynamically, but it's not possible at the end. I try to think about something with the composition API, but maybe I need also to study this a little bit more. So at the end, I ended up uh, doing something a bit, little bit strange. So I basically created the uh, connection by my side. So I implemented the, the code to connect uh, the phone control to the template. So this is the first part. Uh, I just uh, use, uh, put the values inside using the right value because I'm implementing the phone control, in, uh, the control value accessory in every component. So I can rely on that also. So using the right value uh, to act actively put the value inside the component and also adding the classes based on the status of the form. Then I connected it with the value changes, the sudden changes to change some, uh, to put the new value and to change some styles. And then uh, at the end, uh, I needed to implement the Marcus Dutch at the function to also uh, change the classes uh, and uh, use the actively provide with the register on change, or register on touch, uh, some function that uh, use the, uh, the phone control that I have inside the component that generate it dynamically. It's, uh, it's a bit strange because I like it, but it's also some, something weird because I'm doing everything from scratch and I don't trust myself. But uh, I'm so also proud because it works. So it's, it was funny to, to, to develop it. I now prepared a demo. This is a famous, uh, I don't know, it's a famous singer, musician, I don't remember, it's, uh, but it's called Demo, so it's fine, it's, it's fun for that. 
Okay, fine. Okay, luckily, Vercel is still working. I was afraid of that. I just created a demo. I have uh, uh, created two different forms uh, with this, uh, let me call it technology. Um, so, since I was, uh, uh, I'm uh, a busy developer, I didn't im implement something too strange of a, con a console log. So we will see that uh, as soon as I enter the simple form, uh, I will have uh, my configuration uh, here in the console. So you can see that I uh, totally build the uh, template uh, using the uh, configuration. Then I have the generated form control that you can see also is, is still is already invalid. Uh, it's so so I let's see if this works. So I basically can type my name. No, okay. This this also is using a custom validator that required me to put two words because I wanted to to show you that it works also with custom validators. This is my name. I'm a senior, but maybe you will think that I'm a middle after this talk. I know how to work with Angular, at least I think. TypeScript also, maybe Clip is not, uh, doesn't think about that. Uh, I will read my, my demo ah, five, maybe to inspire you. And then uh, I also put another validator just to, 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 some, to add more characters to this text field. Something, oh, this is an extension, I guess. It's not something mine. <laughs> Huh? So when you click submit, you will see that there is an alert because uh, again, I was a little bit busy and create a model for something like that was too much for my, uh, I, I really didn't have the time to do it. But you can see that the generated forms has all the values that I expected to have. Uh, I also pre prepared an implementation with a multi-step because basically I can create two different uh, steps, uh, two different collection. I also implemented in, in the real component a way to uh, clear the view when the configuration change and to rebuild it again. So it basically works also with, uh, with multi-steps. Okay, now I'm in my middle uh, and go on. And then we have the second step that is, it's also totally configured with the, uh, with the validators. Voila. And we will see that I also, have the complete the, the complete list of the two steps. So basically, it works. Now, what can we say more about that? Uh, during the presentation of the talk, I discovered that there are plenty of libraries that already do this. So, <laughs> so it was not the best to, for me to show uh, to show you this, uh, but it was an experiment, and I really enjoyed to do it. To do it. Uh, if you are really really interested in doing something. Uh, really bad, good with uh, this kind of logics, uh, I will suggest you to uh, put an eye on Angular Formly. It's a library that uh, 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 is able to do a lot more, much more of what I did, uh, but of course uh, it introduces uh, some more logics and complexity in your project. So if you don't need to do uh, super complicated stuff, maybe you can think about uh, doing something like what I did. If you want to, See the code, uh, you can type my name uh, on GitHub and you will find my GitHub profile or you can feel free to block me during the conference uh, to offend me and to ask me also the, the GitHub repository. Maybe why not? Uh, and thanks for being here. Yeah, went well. Ah, yeah. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> okay. Now I'm angry. Yeah. So it's my time. And uh, yeah, give me one second. So guys, uh, remember to post questions on Slido. Uh, as we did before, so we have uh, contents for the panel, and uh, yeah, please welcome Sumaya, which has been mic'd now, and uh, yeah, we're here at talk about Helify and Angular iteration, so new topics, and we will see.
Okay, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So, hi everyone. Uh, nice to be here again this year. Uh, today I'm talking about angular hydration. And I will explain it like I'm five because it's like the way that I like to uh, understand things and to learn things. So, LI5, explain like a five, angular hydration. So, for starting, uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Sumaya Radi. I am a lead software developer at Scaling Parrots. Uh, I'm from Brescia in the north of Italy. And I work mainly with front end lately. Uh, I'm team leader of the front end team. And I like everything that is technology. So I do a lot of courses and workshops about like electronics and coding, of course. Uh, this is my stack, my actual stack. My favorite is Angular, of course. And yeah, it's what I'm working with lately. And since I'm working with Angular a lot, um, I'm starting hearing about hydration with Angular 16 this year. Uh, because like with Angular 16, hydration was everywhere. Like all the other uh, JavaScript frameworks and libraries was using uh, hydration and it was like everyone was all about server-size rendering yeah. and hydration but we didn't have a good solution with Angular so it was something that yeah everything is doing it but we are maybe a little bit behind the hype but actually with Angular 16, we got hydration. But what is hydration in like as as not as the technology, but as like a concept? And actually, hydration is not something that is about a uh, programming language, but is something general in computer programming. Actually, if like we have in this in this example, a class person with some information about the person and we instantiate a new like person as a variable, uh, we just get an empty object. But when we fill this object with um, actual data, like my name, my last name, my age, we actually get, uh, we hydrate the object. So hydrating is like filling something with data with information that we are using it. So it's something that we have always like used without like knowing that is actually hydration, but yeah, it's something that it was always there. But we cannot talk about hydration without talking about server-side rendering. So what is server-side rendering? It's like a technique that allows us to render our application on the server and just get the rendered HTML uh, directly from like the server. And this is like something different what, uh, on what we are used to because like we are used to do everything on the client side and to use like our application like a single page application and just uh, do everything uh, dynamically using JavaScript on our client. Um, but what are the benefits on using like server-side rendering? The benefits are like the first like initial page load that we don't have like this white um, like blank page at the start of our project, but like we have faster like uh, loads on the page. We have improved uh, SEO that is really important for search engines and better performance. We need performance. So this is like the solution that we are all moving to uh, for front-end development. But let's talk about uh, a little bit about history. So in the old days, like at the beginning of the century, actually all like the concentration was on server-side rendering because like we, used like technologies that are working on the server like uh, PHP, Python, um, Ruby on Rails or ASP.NET, Java was all like languages that uses server side. And there wasn't like anyone thinking about client side actually. 
And then 10 years later, it's actually flipped completely. And now we are all like on the client and like server side rendering was something about the past and no one thought, thought that uh, will be used again like server side on the future. And on the modern web, what we have today is like combining this server side rendering and client side rendering to get like the best performance for our application. Because like now we have the focus on the user. So for like uh, developers, it's better for us like to concentrate client only or server only because like uh, it's something less things to uh, manage, less things to um, understand but actually for the user the most important thing is performance and to get things fast so combining these two um, rendering uh, technologies uh, may be used to uh, help the user experience but where did angular fit in this uh, lineup angular was created in 2011 so in the age of single page applications. So it was client side uh, and always have been like client side. Um, actually, uh, on uh, 2013, uh, when Angular JS, so Angular version one, was presented at uh, NGConf, uh, the Angular team like told us that um, actually they built a solution uh, for server side rendering on version one, but they abandoned it. And the reason for that was that uh, users want server-side rendering for SEO and performance. And as they could improve client-side rendering, this would not like be a, a big deal. So they concentrated on that. And lately at the same conference, uh, Mishko, that is like the creator of Angular, he was like thinking about the future of front-end development and he was like do you think that server-side rendering will be a thing on the future and he was no absolutely not and this is funny because like if you talk with Mishko now he cannot to stop talking about server-side rendering and he actually built his own javascript uh, framework that is all centered on uh, server-side rendering so it's like reflective of the time and now actually with uh, 2023, we actually have finally a good solution for server-side rendering. Um, so what is server-side rendering? Uh, let's see like a, a little bit of comparison between what we are used to. So single page application, we have the browser that um, just re uh, renders uh, speaking with the server and gets the HTML that has like everything. So what we see is a single page application where we can like uh, handle all like the communication with our APIs uh, and all like the routing is all like client side. With server side rendering, we don't like uh, communicate with the server just one time, but we, we communicate every time that we change route. So every time that we request a new route, we speak with the server and we get the HTML of the specific route that we are on. And with APIs, we can actually, um, the server can actually manage the, to get the data for us directly from the server. So the HTML that we are getting is already filled with data. We can still like communicate from the client side, but like for performance, um, issues it's better like to uh, handle everything on the server side and then angular universal came out angular universal was like a baby of this this guy jeff whipley that is uh, he was at that conference in 2013 when, when angular js was uh, presented for the first time and he was a little bit disappointed with the Angular team because he needed server-side rendering for his project that he was working on. So he built a solution for server-side rendering by himself. And he presented it uh, a couple of years later in a lightning talk on ng-conf. And 
it was really good, uh, a really good idea. And he got like the support of the Angular team and he started working with them at his uh, package that is Angular Universal. And it's a tool that uh, has all the uh, support for server-side rendering for the Angular applications. So with Angular Universal, um, Universal you can actually um, improve all uh, your uh, application with SEO and user experience just using uh, uh, server-side rendering. And to use that, it was like um, just this package that you need to add to your application uh, and Universal Express Engine that just adds some files to your uh, application. That was like configuration file, server file, and uh, some uh, configs for the application. And adding also like all these uh, run uh, commands to build, serve, and to um, render your application uh, from your project. And then from uh, the Angular team, they built this uh, platform server that allows um, the server-side rendering also like from the Angular, because like at the beginning when he built his solution, he didn't get like the support of Angular. So he built it on top of what was existing. So they had a little bit of trouble at the beginning. So now when they start to work together, they added some like solution inside the Angular um, project itself. And it actually generates the server for you and the bootstrap all the application um, with all the models and all the imports from your projects. And Express Engine um, from uh, Angular Universal actually uses ExpressJS to serve your uh, application and gets all the information from them. And it's just like this uh, configuration uh, that it's already like uh, auto-generated when you um, import the package. With Angular 16, we had an improvement on this uh, server-side rendering solution because it was presented hydration. Hydration, what is this hydration? It's something that is between server-side rendering, so the server and the client. And this actually uh, allows us to um, use um, what uh, we get from the, the server and use it on our client side. Because like uh, without hydration, what we had is like from our uh, browser, we request our uh, route from the server. Uh, the server generates an HTML and send it to the client. And then Angular Bootstraps destroys this HTML and regenerates a new HTML. So this is, was like double uh, work that wasn't necessary. And you get like a, a, a little bit of um, a strange effect at the beginning. So with hydration, we can just reuse what the server just generated. And with the, uh, with the help with the, uh, of JavaScript, we just uh, re, uh, reuse uh, all the HTML and get a better like user experience. Let's see a, a little demo to just show you in action uh, this part. So with Angular Universal, we just uh, need to uh, import Angular Universal and make sure that uh, the version of Angular Universal was the same of uh, the Angular clay that you are using. And as you can see, we have all the uh, running um, commands that already um, was um, generated for us, auto-generated. And here I have a simple um, page uh, application with a uh, homeworks um, message. And I did a little bit, uh, a resolver with a little bit of timer, uh, three seconds timer, just to show you the render uh, problem that was at the beginning without hydration. So when I serve like normally without server-side rendering, uh, the application, the, the result will be this one. So 
blank page, three seconds, and then we get homeworks. So this is like what we are used to. If we use a server-side rendering solution here, as you can see, like here is don't use it for production because it was something just for um, the developer use. So we have three seconds, uh, we get the HTML, and then three seconds again, and then we just have the HTML regenerated from like Angular. And this was really bad because like you can see like this flitch uh, at the beginning of the of the application, and it was a little bit useless to to have it. So now with Angular 16, with just one command on the uh, Angular config here on providers, if we just add uh, provide client hydration with just this, we are enabling uh, hydration. And if we re-render our page, we just, let me redo this, maybe this way. Just have three seconds and then we get our HTML and it's already hydrated. So now it's like um, responsive and you can use it without Angular regenerate everything uh, for us. So it's a little bit uh, something, a step forward. And we finally had a solution that actually worked for us with Angular. And it was a big step actually for, for hydration for server side rendering. And now, uh, three weeks ago or so, we have Angular 17 that is going like much forward. And we had everything new, a new logo, new uh, features from the Angular team that you already seen uh, today. And we had a big news for hydration because now Angular hydration is stable for version 17. And it's actually, uh, it's something that is embedded into Angular. So you don't need to use Angular Universal anymore because like now when you, out, when you generate a new application um, with NGNU, with the flag SSR, you just enable server-side rendering from the start. And actually, um, if you like forgot to use the, the flag, it asks you if you want server-side rendering. So it's something that is more important now for Angular because the community asked so much for this uh, to the Angular team and we got it. And now for Angular 17, um, the default is no. So if you don't say anything, uh, it will not be uh, server side, but the plan for version 18 and more, it will be like to be default for um, when we generate a new ap application. So to enable server side rendering, um, Angular Universal, um, it wasn't, it, it's not a, a different repository anymore. It's now part of the Angular CLI um, repository. So it's integral part of Angular. And if you want to use server-side rendering on your project, on an older project, or uh, if you forgot to do it, you can just add Angular SSR and you can use it. So let's see what's, what's changed now. So let me stop this once. Now we have... Uh, Angular 17, we have Angular SSR, as you can see. And now we don't have all the uh, commands for SSR because now it's something that's it's already like integrated on our project. So we just need to do ng-serve and to start our application. And it's run our server and we just get our application. So same application, three seconds, and then we get our HTML ready to use. Okay, let's go back here. So 
Angular team with Angular version 17, it had these improvements for us for server-side rendering and for hydration that is uh, ASM support for server builds. That is really important. We have uh, build speed improvements and we need speed in our applications and server-side um, uh, developer server uh, improvements and all this you will get it with Angular 17 with all the other good stuff that was released with it. And so if you haven't already, go and update your project and to get all the crazy stuff that the Angular team uh, worked on and delighted us with it. And yeah, that's it for me. This is like all my social if you want to connect with me. And thank you. <laughs> Cool. Hello, everyone. How are you? Are you enjoying the event? Yes? No? Are you still awake? Great. So, before we start our next panel, we have an announcement to make. As you can imagine from the video, we are organizing our next event in June 2024. How many of you attended our last event in December last year? Hmm. Okay, so a lot of and you so and today we are officially opening our sales okay thank you very much so just so in order to thank you all for attending this event either in person or online we will give you a discount code 20 percent off just for today until 6 p.m 10 seats available so if you enjoyed the event and you would like to help us, just, you know, go on the website. You can get more information there. You can use this until the end of the day. Okay? Thank you very much. Now, we have the, our lottery program. Okay. Uh, before to go with the panel, uh, I want to uh, have a game with you. So we are going to uh, give away two books uh, that packed our sponsor of the event, give us. So it's uh, two books. Can I have the book, please? OK. So thank you, Pact, for this. We have the one book, uh, Learning Angular, and uh, another one is the Angular Project. So uh, just... Uh, Use the QR code to use the, the application. Uh, you are going to take a selfie. Let's do it also from home because uh, for you, I have some uh, uh, ebook version of Pact. So let's do it. Take the picture and uh, we are going to extract some uh, lucky from you. Okay, so 
Let's take some minutes for this. Mm. Se vinciamo lo lanciamo però. Oh, wow, wow, wow. That's fantastic, amazing. No, um, Luca, Luca, see, you, you need to do it. <laughs> too much, too much. Let's wait some. Some years. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Joe. <laughs> How do you feel now? <laughs> really lucky. Thank you very much. Thanks. Another one. Two. One. Claudio. Okay, for Claudio. Uh, we are going to contact you directly and uh, share with the day book with you. Let's take another one. Another one from mom, okay. Always we are going to contact you. Vitali, where is? Where is Vitali? Come here, come here. Hey, thank you. Okay, uh, it's time to have the panel, so please welcome on the stage uh, Sumaya and Davide, our MC. Okay, go, go. This way. Okay. So, shall we start? Yes? Okay, cool. So thank you guys. It was really interesting. Uh, okay, before I read a few questions on uh, you know, our Q&A, I actually have one question for both of you. <laughs> Don't worry, it's, it's easy. <laughs> the first is for you. So uh, you introduced something quite cool, especially you know, a lot of applications are generally form input. Okay, so how you deal with managing these forms when they grow? With the application so how you can maintain these kind of you know especially when there are a lot of code involved thank you so basically uh, how you will maintain something like what i showed uh, or generally speaking yeah, yeah, both. both okay generally speaking uh, uh, at a, uh, as a best practice i like to uh, generate components that are able to connect with the direct the forms uh, directly so <laughs> Um, at least uh, I try to handle everything that possible using the, the power of the reactive forms. Uh, so, for instance, yesterday I was uh, at NG Girl uh, workshop uh, and uh, talking with uh, one of the attendees. Uh, I was explaining that uh, imagine when you need to uh, do a form like uh, password and confirm password, uh, how do you manage it? Uh, because maybe you will need a validator. And in that case, I try to be clever. So I try to uh, generate a phone group uh, that has both inputs uh, and uh, 
create a, a custom validator that checks if the, all the controls inside the, are the same. So in this way, I, I reuse a lot of stuff like this. So validators, uh, structures, and so on, also components. So it helps you creating forms uh, uh, really fast uh, and also to reuse the code uh, the most. For what I show you today, um, imagine that both with the, the blue pill and the red pill, so both the version of the creation of the template will, uh, will, will grow a lot. Maybe we can think about implementing something better for the red pill, so for the uh, dynamic generation, something that could be like have a, a map to say which are the fields that I will use for a component and which not, uh, but at if you need to do something really, really uh, heavy, uh, really, really complicated with what I show you, maybe you don't need what I show you. So maybe you will need something more complex like Angular Formly. So it's kind of a, a, a sort of feeling that you have because you are going to maintain the code. So you need to be sure that you will be able to maintain the code and you will, you will need to find your strategy. At least it, this is what I suggest to my colleagues. Thank you. And um, question for you. So why we should use, you know, this kind of things about Angular SSR and, uh, you know, it, it seems to be quite old school, you know, you actually show something like PHP, Ruby on Rails, uh, GSP, you know, this kind of uh, like old technology. So why someone that is using something more new should actually consider this kind of uh, technology? So yeah, it's old school because like uh, we are used to see that stuff as like something old, something boomer for boomers. <laughs> but uh, actually, if you see like the potentiality of it, uh, like how in like a big um, a big uh, application, in particular like application that have a lot of data that needs to be like loaded at the first time, like with an initial load that will be like uh, really small, um, server-side rendering is actually helping because like you can see the actual data it, it, at the same time when you just uh, refresh the page. And for users, I think that is so important. Uh, I actually work with blockchain. So with blockchain, blockchain is really small slow so i'm used to see what like performance issue are because like sometimes you need five to ten seconds to see something on screen and this is so bad and so for uh, web 2 applications sometimes it took like half a second and it seems a small amount of time in comparison of what i'm using but it's still something that i need to wait to see something and the less the user waits to see something on the screen the more like he enjoys to use your application thank you okay i'm gonna read a couple of questions from you guys the first is like someone says you know your example looks like formally and <laughs> but <laughs> okay so uh, okay, question, this one. Does SSR and hydration work with an X module, Fede, you know, module federation or micro front end? Question. Uh, actually, I've never tried it, but I've seen uh, a demo on another conference where uh, a guy just used it, and it's actually something that is working really really good like uh, even if like i'm usually uh using like angular as like as it is i don't like to use other mm -hmm. stuff like on support of that uh and this is like my mistake my idea but it's still i think that is like even better actually Thank you. Uh, this is for you, Davide. Will you create your lib? I don't know who asked it, but probably you were, they were interesting. But your solution? Crazy guy. <laughs> uh, no, uh, for now, I didn't meant to uh, build a library with that uh, because uh, there are plenty of library. I, I discovered it. But uh, yeah, I will think about something like that, maybe with some improvement 
but honestly, I will wait a little bit uh, because uh, I'm really curious to see if uh, the Angular team will uh, drop something like uh, uh, forms uh, with signals. So maybe it would be better to wait to invest time in a project like this uh, in order to use in that, uh, that kind of technology. So we'll see. But yeah, thanks uh, for the interest. Uh, you can find me and I will uh, be grateful to you forever. <laughs> OK, this is for you, Somaya. Uh, if we migrate existing project to SSR, what kind of pitfall should we expect is the migration straightforward, or do we need to take care of specific issues? Oh, this, this ha happened actually yesterday at the NG, NG Girls uh, workshop, because like um, a group like accidentally used server-side rendering for the project. But it was like uh, something for beginners. <laughs> so it was a little bit like too much for them maybe to start with. Um, and there was actually a problem with local storage because like you are on the server now, so you, ca you cannot access local storage. Uh, there are other solution for that. Uh, like there is um, another way to uh, manage the storage on the server side, but like uh, sometimes if uh, you stick on what you are using on the client, when you do the switch, you need to make sure that you are covered on that side. Thank you very much. Uh, this is for you, Davide. Uh, okay, how do you handle the different layout that the design team wants? Yeah, maybe I skipped that part a little bit, uh, but uh, yeah, you can rely on the uh, classes that the form uh, is going to apply on your host element. So you will have the ng touched if the user interacted with the uh, with the input, uh, ng untouched if he did not, uh, the pristine, dirty, mm, valid, invalid. So you can rely on that uh, to create your. Um, your graphic version of the component. For instance, uh, in some companies, they like to uh, show the error just if the user interact with the component, uh, because maybe it's like uh, not really great to, to say to the user, you are already wrong right, writing the, uh, the, the information. So maybe you will want to use a combination of that uh, by your own, uh, based on your requirement. So you can use that kind of, uh, of classes. And this is why I prefer to uh, make the component be able to work with the directives because uh, if you use the for control as an input and you apply the directive directly on the basic html component uh, you will end up to use an ng class if you want to style uh, another part of the code that is not the basic component and you basically are uh, uh, creating uh, again uh, some logic that the directive is able to to perform so that's why i don't consider the in the past input uh, in input different control is a bit, uh, good practice just for that. Cool, thank you. Uh, this is for you. Uh, what role does the state management have in a server side rendering application? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough one. <laughs> okay. It's anonymous, so I don't know. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it's actually now that is like uh it's not like a different repo because like with angular universal there was a lot like of issues uh to like manage in particular when there was like a, a switch between like um a version to another because like they wasn't like into the angular team uh project so they didn't know what was um, what they were working at. So uh, sometimes maybe at the beginning with uh, when Signals just uh, was presented, there was a little bit of issues. And actually they, uh, with Angular 16, they uh, were saying that it wasn't, there wasn't like a support for uh, everything uh, with server-side rendering. But now that is like, part of the Angular Clear repository, it's actually something that the Angular team itself is managing. Um, so it's production ready. And that's 
is something that before uh, Angular 17, uh, it wasn't. So you couldn't use server-side rendering on production. So now that it's production ready, you can uh, have the support. I think that's the only support that we don't have uh, from the Angular team with server-side rendering is uh, translations. This is like the only thing that is still missing. And I know that they are working with, but otherwise we can like use anything. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. This is another question for you. It's possible to run an application with only CSR uh, in Angular 17 and SSR enable when the SSR is in the default option? <laughs> so that's quite a, a trick question. This one. Uh, so maybe um, maybe for like the next version when it will be like a default uh, for like um, from Angular 18. This is what like Angular team has presented that will be like for default, and I. Personally, don't think it's a good idea because like it's something new for Angular. And I think that we should be able to not use it when we don't think it's necessary or we are not ready or like maybe for beginners is something uh, too much to like be ready to do it as default. But I'm sure like as like for standalones, for example, there is a way to like don't use them. Uh, so maybe will be like a solution to cover all also like this this part okay thank you very much uh i do have a question for you david eh? uh, this is uh a word <laughs> just you know, uh you know is there any way to actually handle dynamic form with translation so this is possible well, since it's not a library and it's something that you can pay, copy and paste, uh, maybe you can uh, just use a translate service or something like that before setting the uh, the label inside the component. Why not? Uh, or maybe you can the, you can uh, design your component to have like a pipe, a translate pipe inside it. Uh, I know it's not the best choice. I don't like also that kind of stuff. But yeah, for sure you can you can try something. the 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 best uh, the, the best uh, that you can do with my code uh, is to to break it uh, or to fix it. So uh, I su really suggest you to uh, uh, download it uh, to play with it a little bit. Uh, not because it's a great code, but it, because it's uh, um, an implementation that really help you to start to thinking about how the Angular form works uh, and maybe. If uh, you need to add something more, you can try to do it. But yeah, I think that there should be a way to, to handle this. I, I will try if you want, <laughs> and he will let you know. OK. <laughs> OK, uh, I think that our time is over. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It was really nice to have you here. Hey, hello, guys, one second, please. The is not ready yet. So if you can wait five minutes, they are still uh, uh, organizing. So sorry, we were a bit, you know. Eh? <laughs>
think it's in a, an helpful. And uh, the idea is uh, you need a tool to create uh, your backend easily in your language, Node.js, JavaScript, and I hope uh, spend uh, a lot of money. Um, I'm sorry, a lot of money for, uh, for us, but for you, uh, less money as possible. Okay, so I show you this, uh, this tool. It's a, a Microsoft tool. Um, not only Microsoft, I show you in a while, but uh, we talk about Azure function. So what is an Azure function? Um, you can imagine an Azure function like a snippet of code, okay? Just a method, just a method in C-sharp. You can see a lot of language, a lot of language, five languages, uh, Node.js, I show you in a while uh, a demo, little demo, sorry. I'm not an expert in uh, Node.js, but yeah, it's uh, very easy. Java, C-sharp, sorry, but we are Microsoft. We need to use uh, C-sharp and, and Python. I know you are in Microsoft. I, I work for Microsoft and my name is Massimo. Sorry, I don't, I don't uh, uh, introduce myself and also PowerShell. So the idea is uh, this kind of uh, tools. Uh, you can use this kind of tools, for example, to create your backend, an API, REST API, a lot of REST APIs. But uh, because you have PowerShell, you can create also for automation and so on. Okay. Azure function is a snippet of code. Yeah, but Massimo, Azure function, the name is Azure. So you want that we use Azure because you want to uh, take me in your uh, platform. Not just because Azure function, because uh, the native environment is Azure, but uh, your snippet of code run of a runtime. This runtime can run on your PC, on Docker, containerization, or Azure. So the idea is, uh, i show you in a while, you can take your function, you can containerize, and then you can run in Raspberry or uh, in a Kubernetes, right? Azure function is uh, uh, a serverless uh, tool, a serverless technology. So the idea is uh, I want that my application scale based on the event uh, that receives. When you create uh, an API, probably the events is the call, the API, the HTTP call. But you can imagine you want to react, for example, if someone put a file in a directory or if someone send you an event, a, a Kafka event, for example, you can use Azure function. So you need a component of, your, of the Azure function platform called a trigger that run your function. When someone make a call to your HTTP endpoint, the platform starts your function, manage the request, and so on, okay? So the name of the component in the Azure Function Platform is Trigger. You have a lot of trigger, not so much, uh, 50 triggers uh, in, uh, in the Azure plan Platform, in the, in the Azure Function Platform. But you, if you want, you can create your custom trigger. It's not easy, 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 but it's not so difficult. I can do by myself. So generally, Microsoft use myself to test if something is, is simple, if I can do it. Uh, it's very simple, so I can do it, so it's perfect. Yes, Massimo, fantastic. I can run my function, but probably my function need to communicate to the external world, a database, another file share, or so on. You can use a component of the Azure Function Runtime, call it Bing, uh, bindings, uh, that allow you to write in a database, SQL, Cosmos DB, and so on. But for example, if you want to write in MongoDB, you don't have a, a, a binding. So you can create by yourself a custom or use your existing services, existing class, if you are in C Sharp or component, if you are in Node.js, okay? So the best way you reach the best performance, the best uh, life cycle for your object, for the memory, if you use the binding, you need to use the trigger, otherwise uh, your function never start, but you can integrate your component, okay? So it's not so difficult to understand what is an Azure function. Let me drink. I remember now that um, I don't take the coffee, so if I go down, you can reach me. Um, how can I host my function on Azure? Remember, I am Microsoft, so, I want to show you what you can do in native cloud. Then 
here you can find other possibility, okay? The first one is the consumption plan. This is the real serverless one. So the idea is uh, you pay only for the execution. What does this mean? I am a startup, I want to try. I put my function, nobody call me. I don't spend anything. I don't, yeah, no, I don't have any money from my customer, but I don't spend anything, okay? It's uh, not, not really, you spend if you have a lot of, a lot of requests, a lot of uh, execution, but I suppose that you have uh, a lot of uh, executions, probably you have some money, okay? I show you the pricing in a while. Uh, this is probably the best, uh, uh, the best environment, the best uh, plan you can use to try, or you can use if you need to test, dev and test. Then you can have other two uh, plan that allow you to have more performance, uh, predictable pricing. The pricing is important. I, I, I hope you spend a lot in Azure because I have, I have a family, so I, and I have a dog, as you can see, and I eat a lot, so I, I prefer you spend a lot. But yeah, I know that pricing is something you need to care about when you go to the cloud, okay? So this kind of two plans allow you to manage the cost, and uh, have uh, a similar, this, this one is the second one, the premium one is uh, not completely full serverless because you need to, to, to set up some uh, configuration about the CPU and the memory. Yeah, but you spend, you can control the cost, so it's important. But because I told you that you run on a runtime and then you can use a container, you can host on Kubernetes, or you can substitute here, whatever you want that allow you to run a container. And so it means uh, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, uh, Kubernetes, uh, AKS, uh, blah, 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 something similar. And I don't know, Raspberry, as you prefer. And this one, this is another uh, service in Azure that uh, give you the same orchestration capabilities of Kubernetes, but without managing the cluster. Just, just to, to tell you, okay? That one is free. Ah, uh, yeah, Massimo, I know that Microsoft don't have anything free. You want that we do, we use the, the function because in this way we can join Azure and you uh, grab our money. I take the pricing page. This is the free part. One million of calls uh, is a lot, okay? So again, if you are a startup, you need to try, probably you don't reach 1 million execution during a, a month, probably. If you reach more, you need to pay. But how? I make an example here. Imagine uh, what, 3 million times, uh, 3 million execution during a month with a function that uh, occupy enough gigabyte. Enough gigabytes in Node.js, it's a lot. Uh, I'm not an expert in Node.js. I write uh, something horrible. I never reach uh, uh, enough uh, gigabyte of memory, okay? Just to make an example. And the execution duration is one second. One second is a lot for an API, probably. Then with this configuration, you spend this one. is not so much, okay? So it's a good idea to use Azure Function. Let me show you something. Okay, I create a, I create a simple repo in, uh, in GitHub. I give you, this is the, the two dogs that, I, this is the reason why, they are the reason why I need the money. So yeah, I invite you to use Azure because I need to, to give them keep. Okay, I create, uh, Actually, this is the, the Azure portal. I don't know if you know the Azure portal. It's not important. I create uh, a function. Let me scroll, otherwise we don't see anything. Do you see something Do you see on, in the back? Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I use the clear, the, the white uh, background just because otherwise the other people in, in, the, in the back of the, the room. No, honestly, I use the, the, the white uh, even in the real life, but anyway. Okay. Let me go, I create, a, I show you, uh, I start with the function. So this is the, 
the repo. I give you the link in the, in the slide. In the slide, we, you will find the, the, the link. I use, uh, I don't know if you know code spaces. Raise your hands if you know code spaces. I'm very happy that you don't know what is what code spaces. Code spaces is a, a way you can create an environment based on containers. Code spaces is based on containers. When you start code space, all the tools you need, in this case, Node.js, and uh, the Azure function runtime, and the extension you can use in Visual Studio Code, for example, for um, the, the Azure function will be packeted in a package, in a, in a container. The container will be running, and then you can connect through the, the web, for example, just clicking on that. Or if you click on this, you can open in <gasps> Jupyter Lab. It's not Microsoft. Yes, also in uh, Jupyter Lab, the JetBrain, and also, of course, Visual Studio Code. Use Visual Studio Code because we need money. Visual Studio Code is free, so we don't. <laughs> just in case. OK, I click on Visual Studio Code. Uh, as you can see here, it's connected. I, I am connected to that. I am my function. You are an expert on Node.js, I suppose, or in JavaScript. This is a simple function. It is an HTTP function, so receive a get verb for the H HTTP. Just retrieve the name from the query or uh, for the body. Otherwise, put a word and say hello, word, hello, Massimo, hello, something similar. Okay, very, very easy. I promise that you that the the session will be easy, so it's okay. I also promise that that will be clear, I'm sure. Okay, let me drink. Next time I use the grappa here, but it's better. And I create also a workflow in the GitHub to compile, install, Compile, install npm, compile, build, and test, and deploy on Azure function, on, on, on Azure, okay? So, of course, I'm using Azure. I'm using the consumption part, okay? But you can create the, the container with the runtime and the Azure function. You deploy on Kubernetes, whatever you want, okay? Because I'm an expert on GitHub. If you try, you create a function app. Function app is the service that host the consumption, host your function, there is a, a, a button and say, hey, create for me the action that pointing on that GitHub repo, deploy the function. So I'm not an expert, just click, click, click. I know that is not The log, this is the log part, sorry, here. Come on, Massimo. During the demo, generally, the Azure broken or the connection broken, something happened, or the PC is, okay. This one is the function, exactly the same, okay? This is the log, let me take the URL. It is a get, so I can say this one. Hello, word. And sorry, I need to move this one to the other one because I don't have connected the APM server to uh, collect the log. So I need to use the other file system log uh, op option. But because you are don't trust me, I repeat the request. This is the API, okay? 
Yeah, but this is uh, something uh, fake, Massimo. I know that you are Microsoft. You create only fake function. Yeah, I agree with you. But uh, yeah, I can go there. Say, for example, and uh, and that's all and that's all yes okay trust me and uh, come on massimo here let me check if something happened on action amazing engine submit version what time try to prove you it's easy to deploy. It's easy to create a function. It is no JS. It's just uh, to remember what is this, the, the name of the HTTP trigger or the Cosmos trigger or your custom trigger. Yeah, but there is the documentation for that. But it's also to deploy. I'm using GitHub. You, I want that I use GitHub because you are Microsoft. If you want, you can use GitLab or Jenkins because you have a command that allow you to deploy. I'm not, we are not so bad as you, as you, as you think. Okay. Yeah, we are bad, but not so, 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 so bad. Come on. Okay. In the, 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 the function action is the deployment. Okay. I'm deploying, blah, 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 blah. It's, it is working. Finger cross just to be sure that the, the demo is working. Perfect. Now go there. Now I can go home because the yeah the idea is uh, you use Node.js. It's easy to write the function. It's a different way you think the, the the code because you need to think about the code, not the plumbing code that hosts your function. Maybe a good, maybe good or not depends on your uh, uh, on your way of thinking. Uh, if you want to host in a managed service like uh, Azure Function. It is easy. Otherwise, probably your action, your GitHub workflow will be more complex, but it's not so, it's not rocket science. Okay. Five minutes. Come on, Massimo. Just to recap, it's not easy to come on. Okay. Uh, to, to, re, to, to have a, a full session about uh, Azure Function, but I hope I give you some hints. Uh, at least the, the the graphic is good, but yeah, if the content is not so good for you, the graphic is good. So it's a serverless architecture, as I said. You you think about your business problem, not about the plumbing code. Is something not related to the Azure function, but it's something related to the serverless architecture. Azure function is serverless. So one cost effective. I have in my subscription a couple of. Uh, function that run one time, one time every second uh, since uh, three years, I don't spend anything just because uh, I don't reach the 1 million calls in the, in the month. So maybe good. I cannot show you because we, I need more time, but uh, the, the, the Azure function like other uh, services in Azure, like for example, static web app that allow you to host static web app, SPA and the function together as some built-in of security authentication multi-provider. So you can configure your website to reach Microsoft uh, uh, Active Directory, Enter ID, or Google, or uh, Apple, or whatever you want. If you want, you can use it just by configuration. Otherwise, you, you have. And it is free, just, just in case. And also, you have a scalability because uh, it is a serverless, another uh, feature of the serverless architecture is uh, it is even driven architecture. So if you receive one call, you have one execution. If you if you receive one hundred thousand calls, you have one hundred thousand uh, execution. Okay. So this is my reference. I thank you for the patience after lunch. If you want, uh, thanks. This is my LinkedIn if you want, I am here. We have the panel, so thank you. Ah, I give you some uh, references. This is the repo 
That the second one is more interesting is a video about uh, what I told you today, probably in the, in the best way that my that my but it's okay, and some other uh, learning part to to learn about that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, hello. So, yeah, thank you, Massimo, of course. And now um, I would like to welcome on stage Alisa, and uh, she will talk about uh, their safety in Angular. And uh, she's from Okta. We did a workshop uh, yesterday um, in security. And so um, we will get more information about their services and security in a few. And again, uh, the link on Slido is the same, so you can post questions, and afterwards we will do panel for, for that too, okay? Perfecto. Yeah. All right. Hello, hello? Yeah, thank you. Oh. Yeah, no problem. All right, hello everybody. I am so excited to be here with you today. You know, speaking at NG Rome in 2021 was one of my early conference uh, appearances. So I'm really, it was the virtual one. So I'm really happy to finally be able to be here in person and uh, see y'all. So today we're gonna talk about everybody's very favorite topic, security. I know you're excited, right? Before we get going, I have this scary tale to tell you. Let's say that you're a fan of K-dramas and you work on a K-drama fan site. On this fan site, you can navigate to an individual K-drama to add comments. So one day, you navigate to your own K-drama fan site to add comments and you see there's already awful comments written in your name and you know you're not the one who did that. Oh no, what do we do? How do we stop this from happening to other K-drama fans? Well, we have to add security to our site. Because web vulnerabilities can cause risk to your assets, and those assets include your application, your data, your end users and their data, and your reputation. Not to mention there's a financial impact to this as well. And it all adds up the liability, which is a big scary word for C-suite type folks and legal teams and things like that, right? Nobody wants liability. So it's up to us as web developers to make sure we're following security best practices and incorporating that into our application as we go along, because it's not something we can just throw over the fence to the security team. So who am I to be talking to you about this? I'm Elisa. I'm a senior developer advocate at Okta. I am a Angular GDE and on the core team of NG Girls. You might have maybe guessed it, but I'm also a fan of K-dramas. And you can find me on the socials at Elisa Duncan but I'm also a, just a regular dev. I'm not a security expert. It just so happened that because of my job, I was allowed some time to dig around in Angular's code base, look into the security practices there, and I found such great stuff. I wanted to share that with you today. You can't talk about web security without talking about the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP. This is a group whose sole mission is to make the web a safer place. And they have a lot of different resources and content and projects that they do to do this. One of the things they work on is evaluating web applications, identifying vulnerabilities, and then categorizing those vulnerabilities by impact and by incidences. And they periodically release this list as the OWASP top 10. And it was most recently released in 2021. Now, since this is a list of web vulnerabilities, we should have awareness over all the items in this list. But today, we're going to focus on just two of them for lack of time, on the number one OWASP vulnerability, broken access control, and the number three vulnerability, injection. 
starting first with injection, which includes cross-site scripting and is the bane of web developers. This occurs when there's not good data and code boundaries and values. And then we take the polluted values, add them into our applications, which gives attackers an avenue to perform unauthorized actions within your application. And it looks something like this. If we go back to our K-Drama fan site, you can navigate to the individual K-Drama to add comments. Now, the hope for commenting systems, anybody writes, especially for K-Drama apps, is that people write in plain text and with a lot of heart emojis, right? But that's not what happens because there's always some jerk and somebody adds a comment like this where they're trying to take advantage of a vulnerability in your application to run a script. So this comment is added to the database and the next time an unsuspecting K-Drama fan arrives at the site, they see that link for free prizes. And who isn't tempted to click on a link for free prizes, right? We all love free prizes. So they click on that link and they get this JavaScript alert that says, yikes. Fortunately, a JavaScript alert is startling, but nothing really happened. However, the precedent that it sets is incredibly dangerous because once an attacker is able to run their script that you didn't intend in your application, they're able to impersonate you, they can perform unauthorized actions, they can read and capture sensitive data, including your login credentials, or even run malware against your machine. Now, I happen to think that K-Drama fan sites are really critical, but let's think about the applications we work on our day jobs as well. So consider what happens if the targeted application is a financial application or healthcare with all that patient data or, oops, or uh, employee data and um, healthcare with all that medical data. Furthermore, consider whatever happens if the attacked user has elevated access within your application. Now they're able to view even more sensitive data or perform even more impactful actions. Yikes. So we need to watch out for cross-site scripting anytime there's poor data hygiene. And then when we, anytime we incorporate those untrusted values into our application via injection sinks. Now, fortunately, Angular is a highly suspicious framework and it treats all values as untrusted which means that it handles that data hygiene for us. And as a result, we have security without effort with no extra things that we have to do on our part. So I want to explain how that works to you today. Anytime you add values within Angular using interpolation, Angular will escape it. So if we add comments into our K-Drama application using interpolation within this paragraph tag, even if that comment is a purposely broken image that runs a script upon error, what we'll see in the application is the text as as that comments exactly as written because Angular has escaped it. So there's nothing now for the browser to interpret and run and we're safe. You can inspect that in DevTools just to make sure and you'll see that it is all in plain text. And if you try to incorporate values within Angular using uh, interpolate, I'm sorry, inter using a property binding to syncs, then um, we also are safe. Let me tell you a little bit about injection syncs. They're web API functions that allow us to create the dynamic content we expect, such as property binding to enter HTML or approaches that load external resources. That is the images source and anchor tags href or styles URL. And anytime we have to use event handlers. So, if we add our comments by property binding to the inner HTML attribute, what we'll see with this purposely broken image is a broken image. But if we inspect it, we'll see that paragraph tag with the image element and no error function. And in the console, what we'll see is that Angular, we see a warning from Angular saying that Angular has removed some content for us. So let's dive into how Angular does the sanitization for us and reveal some of those secrets. If we take a look inside Angular's code base, what we find are lists and lists of safe elements and attributes. Those are the allow lists that we are allowed to have within our application or within HTML. After Angular builds out the view, that is the tree, that is the view, Angular then traverses through every element and attribute in there to make sure that we're safe. So let's take a look at that code and make sure we really understand what's going on, because this is critical, right? I'm just kidding, it's a lot of tedious work. We don't wanna do that. What, we'll, what we want to know though is this list of safe valid elements, valid attributes, 
and a list of attributes that explicitly require sanitization. So what we'll do is step through that broken image comment together using this criteria. First, if we take a look at that image element, we see that Angular classifies it as a safe void element, and therefore it's allowed to be retained and further evaluated. Next, I'll take a look at that source attribute. Now the source attribute is a safe, is, a, uh, is an attribute that explicitly requires sanitization. But however, in our case, there's nothing to sanitize because there's really nothing in here. So it's allowed to be retained, which makes the image element a valid HTML element. That's why we see the broken image in the application. Then we get to that on error attribute. The on error attribute is not a safe attribute and that's why it's removed and we see that uh, warning. If we change our exploit to a previous example we looked at, which is that free prizes here link, if we look at this in the application, what we see is that link for free prizes. And if we inspect that element, what we see is the anchor tag with the href of unsafe colon JavaScript alert, as well as a warning from Angular that it has sanitized an unsafe URL value. URLs explicitly require sanitization, and how Angular handles it is by a regex expression for an allow list of what uh, URLs can be. So it goes into the sanitize method, and it evaluates against the regex, which in our case, it doesn't match because it is actually really unsafe. And that's why we see the console warning appear in the application, as well as where Angular prepends the unsafe colon to the URL, making it so the browser is no longer able to interpret and run, and nothing happens when you click on that link, meaning that we're safe. Angular also allows safe markup. Now, this is really helpful if you want to allow a rich text editor in your application, and you want to allow your K-drama fans to add a comment like this, saying, it's a wonderful drama, the best in strong font. If we take a look at this comment in the application, we see that comment in strong font because strong is a valid inline element. Angular also protects us against many flavors of cross-site scripting. Now, cross-site scripting is pretty sneaky, and attackers are very inventive in the different ways they can do this. One of them is called mutation cross-site scripting. This is where a attacker may put in a, intentionally add a, uh, um, what is the right word I'm thinking of? They'll intentionally add in a, uh, a typo into their uh, comment. And then the browser will turn that typo into something that is valid. So it takes previously safe HTML um, inert HTML, and then becomes unsafe to the process of the browser parsing the markup. How Angular protects us is by repeatedly parsing through the, uh, the, all those elements and attributes during that markup rendering process to make sure that ultimately we have safety when it becomes stable. How thorough is that? So as you can see, without any effort on our part, when we use Angular constructs, we have security because Angular handles the data hygiene for us. And it does the hard work of escaping and sanitizing. So you always want to use Angular constructs anytime you can. With when you do, you have the most amount of safety. Now this means you want to use Angular templates, you want to use property binding, you want to use interpolation, and you don't want to form your own DOM elements. You don't want to manually change the DOM elements. You don't want to use string concatenation to form your uh, HTML templates either. Those are common pitfalls to avoid. Now, there is a way to bypass security though. Now that we talked about ways that you stay secure, we'll talk about how you can make yourself vulnerable here. There might be some legitimate reasons when you need to bypass security. But I will warn you, when you do this, you're entering in some really dangerous territory because you are stepping away from the built-in security mechanisms Angular has. Some legitimate re reasons to do this, though, is like when you legitimately need video trailers in your K-drama application, right? So in this example, we are going to property bind to an iframes source. Notice I'm using a trusted video link. This is crucial when you have to do this because you are stepping away from the built-in security mechanisms that Angular has. So you have to ensure that the link that you are using here is as trustworthy as possible. And I'll show you how we will be doing that here in a sec. 
So if we take this in a template, what we'll do is inject the DOM sanitizer, which is a class that Angular has for purposefully, uh, explicitly sanitizing as well as explicitly bypassing sanitization. Next, we can call the sanitizer, the DOM sanitizer's bypass security trust for the type of value we're trusting. In this case, it's a resource URL. Now notice we're passing in a safe link. This is a link that we have constructed to be as safe as possible. Now here, I've just defined it in code, so you wouldn't need to do this. However, imagine that you're getting that video ID from someplace, right? From an external resource or from a user input. You want to define as much of that value as possible, such as the video hosting location, and maybe even check how that ID is formed, right? The format of it. Keep your attack surface as small as possible. Anyway, once you have that safe link, you can pass it in that bypass security trust method for the type of value you're trusting. And this returns the safe type of value you're trusting. In this case, the resource URL. And now we're able to see the videos in our application because we have marked this as something Angular skips sanitization on. The reason why we might need to do this is because resource URLs might legitimately contain bits of code in there, so we cannot do the sanitization in order to have the video player work. Now, I've mentioned the type of value a few times. And what those really are are security contexts, of which Angular defines five, if you don't include none. We have HTML, style, script, URL, and resource URL. And the reason why these are defined is because Angular doesn't know what type of value it's working with, right, without us telling it. It can't figure it out. And sanitization is extremely contextual. So the way you sanitize uh, HTML is not the same as the way you sanitize styles, for example. So we have to be explicit when we're working with these values. And if you take a look at the implementation for the DOM sanitizer, what we see are the bypass security trust methods for each one of those security contexts we just talked about, as well as an explicit sanitized method where you pass in the security context that you're working with if you needed to do this for uh, various reasons. There's a way in. Under the covers, this method will call the same sanitization methods that we've seen with some of the other property binding examples. Now, you might be wondering, though, now that we see these specific methods to sanitize, you learn that sanitization is contextual and there's all these enums, why, did we have to, why didn't we define that whenever we did the property binding example earlier with the inner HTML? Well, that's because Angular tracks which security context to use for that sanitization based off the attribute that you're binding to. So if we take a look within Angular's code, what we see are maps where it is mapping the security context to use for the attribute that we're binding to, one of them being inner HTML. Very handy. So as we wrap up this section, let me just call out with great power comes great responsibility, right? Just because you can bypass security doesn't mean you should. You definitely shouldn't. However, if you did have to do so, make sure you get a security audit and try to limit the attack vectors that people might use. You always want to use Angular's security mechanisms if you can. So next, we will talk about the number one OWASP vulnerability, the broken access control, which includes cross-site request forgery. Now, cross-site request forgery occurs when the application shares session cookies to untrusted sources. And an example CSRF attack looks like this. Let's say you're doing some online banking and your bank uses cookies to manage their session. Next, you check your emails. And you got an email that seemed kind of fishy and you clicked on the link. And you know what? It happens to all of us, right? So no judgment. But unfortunately, the sender of that email's attacker that's targeting your bank because your bank has some dubious security practices. So you clicked on the link and you were sent to a malicious site that made a that had a hidden form and it made a post back to your bank, Yikes Bank, asking for a money transfer. Now, because you had that active session cookie that your bank didn't guard and you just pass it all around to that malicious site and was forwarded back to your bank, your bank acts on this request 
and it doesn't do any authentic authenticity checks, it, it acts on this request, allowing the money transfer to pass, and the attacker is able to walk away with your hard-earned cash. So there are some mitigation strategies we can employ when we're working with CSRF. One of them is probably to not bank at Yikes Bank. Seems pretty dangerous. But another option is that your bank could have used built-in cookie protection that your browser employs, such as the same site attribute for cookies. If that is not an option for you, or if you need other browser support, or you need extra protection, you can also follow a pattern where you're exchanging the CSRF token back between your front end and your back end. Now, how this, how this uh, mitigation strategy works is that your back end will provide your front end with a special CSRF token cookie. The front end then takes the value of the cookie and then sends it back to the, to the back end in a secondary source. And then your back end will have to do a verification to make sure that the, that the request is authentic by comparing those values. This mitigation pattern is a, we'll say a flavor of the double submit cookie pattern. Actually, yesterday in our, uh, in our workshop, we were looking into this on the OWASP website. And um, they also now call this pattern the, uh, the token to header um, pattern as well. So it's just the flavor of the double submit cookie pattern. So how Angular helps mitigate CSRF is it's got built-in protection to automatically send that token value to, that, to outgoing calls. The API can then verify as a header. So if we take a look at incorporating the HTTP client XSRF module, if you import that, you'll have this protection. The HTTP client XSRF module has an interceptor, which is how it works under the cover to grab that token value from the cookie and add it to the appropriate outgoing header calls. You can also configure the cookie name and the header name if you don't like the standards that are provided. But if you live in a standalone world, you over NG modules, you also get this protection by using the provide, uh, provide HTTP client, you just get it for free. You can also configure the values if you don't like the cookie name and the header name, but you don't have to. Just by importing the HTTP uh, client, uh, then you have this protection. Lastly, the bulk of the number one vulnerability for broken access control is handling the accidental elevation of privilege. Now, this is when somebody who doesn't have the privilege levels they should is able to perform actions that they shouldn't or is able to view data that they shouldn't. And in this case, there is active work we have to do as developers to add these access control checks. This isn't something that Angular can provide for us because access control checks are very, very specific to each system. How Angular does help is that it provides building blocks that we can utilize to build these access control checks that we need. And these building blocks include route guards, so you can protect against uh, certain routes for features and such and add different sorts of guards for them. You can also use structural directives, such as built-in ones, such as the ng-if, or you can create your own custom directive or use control flow if you'd like. And you can also create interceptors, such as adding the authorization header out to outgoing calls or any other HTTP manipulation needs that you have within your system. So as you can see, Angular is like our soft, cozy security blanket. Without any effort on our part, we have security when we use Angular. And when we, need, when we need to add access control checks, Angular gives us those building blocks to do them. If you'd like to learn more, I have a four parts web series a security uh, blog post that you can check out. Um, the slides are in this QR code. And I also have all of my code for this project in GitHub. It's also a great starting point for your own K-Drama fan site if you want to create one. And I do have um, a Pluralsight course out about this with, that goes in a lot more detail. And um, if you're interested in learning more, check out the Octor developer uh, resources. We have a blog as well as a YouTube channel and Auth0 also joins us there too. So we've got lots of great content. And lastly, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to chat with you. Find me out in the hallway if you like. I love talking about authentication, security, identity, access control and uh, K-dramas, so thank you very much.
Yeah. Thank you very much. I guess afterwards we will talk about how we should, you know, uh, implement all the updates that we are asked for and the security, you know, checks on the console that we have. And we usually skip. Okay. So a little bit of change. We have Giuseppe now. Um, he will be talking about his experience with the front end team and how they empowered uh, empowered it and yeah and then we switch for an ai session afterwards uh, with both Gerard and uh, natalia so yeah here we go can you test it let's test the audio go ahead giuseppe right uh one second Okay. All right. Don't worry. Okay. Perfect. I mean, it's always like that. Don't worry. Perfect. You can start. Test. Okay. <laughs> cool. Hi, Jerome. So, uh, how roads lead to Rome? This is a, not a technical talk, but uh, yeah, let's take this journey together. So picture this ancient room where togas was the latest fashion trends and chariot race was the adrenaline rush of the, of the time. And well, they didn't have smartphones, uh, but they had something pretty damn revolutionary for their time. So today we will embark into a journey uh, through the history of ancient Rome, and we will draw some epic uh, parallels between ancient Rome and something a bit more modern, like building or being part of an empowered team. Now, I know what you're thinking about. Uh, how on earth does Colosseum relate to code or to build a team? Well, our empowered team is like the bustling metropolis of Rome were uh, full of diverse talent and all the fervor of a technological revolution. So get ready and uh, let's take this journey together where by the end our road will lead to Rome. And uh, yeah, so let's dive in. Your empowered team is Rome reincarnated, as you can see from the survey I conducted. But uh, we don't have gladiators battling out in the office, for sure. But how cool would that be? But we have dreamers, inventors, and programmers who could give even the mightiest gladiator a run for their money. So think about it. Your team members are like eccentric countries within the vast empire. Each has its unique strengths. Uh, just like the different region of ancient Rome. Some excel in strategy, they are your Roman general. Others, uh, innovation are more innovation oriented and they are uh, dreaming up the next big things. And then of course, we have also gladiators level coders that can take any coding challenge uh, with the ferocity of a lion into the Colosseum. Just as Rome complex road connected the empire and brought it to life, uh, facilitating the exchange of gods and uh, ideas throughout the empire, your empowered team connect brilliant mind across your organization in a melting pot of idea, talents, and backgrounds. Roman roads were the social network of their time, connecting people's ideas and culture. And your teams, just like 
those ancient roads as the power to break down departmental walls that often stifle creativity in your organization. Because when developers collaborate with uh, uh, designer, engineers collaborate with marketers and uh, everything, everyone take his things to the table, here where the magic happens usually. <laughs> so think of it as the beating heart of your company, just as the sand of the Colosseum was for ancient Rome. I've taken this quote from Gladiators. I've seen this film this year, recommended. <laughs> So now, little question time. Who regularly use car or public transport? Raise your hands if so, I think. <laughs> Pretty anyone. Uh, yeah, why that? Because it's fascinating to think that just like the efficient flow of transportation uh, transform a city and uh, uh, in better, the fluidity of communication inside the company or inside your team can revolutionize the entire business. And uh, so roads are a crucial part of our life. Transportation is one of the main arteries of uh, the human world. And when something starts to uh, doesn't work well, uh, it enacts a vicious cycle of uh, bad things that goes on your software, your company, and then everything around it. And that's not a good idea to work with. <laughs> so just as well-designed road network facilitate the movement around the city, open communication and effective collaboration can uh, help you reach your target, your business target, with less stress and more punctuality. So. Communication is the exact parallel of what roads are uh, were, were for ancient Rome. So do you have any idea of how many problems uh, inefficient communication can uh, generate uh, in uh, your organization? So let me give you a fast brief of throwing in some statistic here and there. 59% of workers are quietly quitting in 2023. 80% of workers are loudly quitting directly impeding their company's goal. 68% feel that low trust was harmful to their daily effort and productivity. 24% left a company because they didn't feel trusted by their employer. Plus 43% decreased productivity. Plus 42 missed deadlines and extended timelines. Plus 38 financial impact in a negative way. It's not a plus here. <laughs> plus 68 wasted time. Plus 42% burnout, stress, and fatigue. Plus 30% bad customer experience. Plus 12% lost customer to competitors. And plus 10% lost employee. Yeah, that's, that's a mess, actually. <laughs> there are also another big problem usually in company like the lack of vision because 52 percent of employee in organization don't actually know the vision of their company and uh, 39 percent want to be more involved in contributing in this vision of the company and that data uh, rise a lot to 74 percent in uh, it services that, where we work i think so what are usually main of these communication problems. Fear, shame, lack of skills, articulated hierarchy, and lack of trust for sure. I believe I have seen all of these problems in approximately four years of uh, my work now. Uh, sometimes I've been responsible of that and, well, I don't mind because uh, it's like a relationship now. I know what behaviors I don't like, what behaviors pay attention to and how to react to them. And most importantly, because being aware of something means that we can also find solution for that, for that things. So now I'm not here to give you hold the solution to all problems that goes behind my uh, expertise. But uh, I want to share with you a different approach and some ideas that we can discuss and 
yeah, com communicate about that. So there is no precise recipe for creating a empowered team because, well, human and relationship are so different every time. So um, we must calibrate everything based on our needs and the person we work with and the possibilities we have. So um, one thing is certain. Traditional approach no longer works uh, as they need, usually. And uh, I want to share with you a different approach that can sound a bit unconventional, but I found out uh, a bit effective until now. <laughs> I'm talking about adocracy. So what's adocracy? It's an approach that the team I work with, we started applying by chance, um, not realizing what we were doing or uh, anything else about that. We just discovered that later. And uh, it's an approach uh, that we initiated as a team uh, because I think that we all need to be uh, a bit architect of the organizational structure in the company we work to make it really shine. How adocracy work? Well, in adocracy, decision-making uh, power is decentralized. It's decentralized and it's, uh, uh, it's not like in an empire with an emperor, but it's distributed more horizontally. So all the team take part to decision together and often decisions are made by those closest to the problem or uh, to the opportunity that, that arise. It obviously breaks down department as well that stifle creativity in your company. And uh, yeah, there are basically uh, three pros I evidentiated. Flexibility for sure, because well, adocracy quickly adapts to changing market needs and uh, unexpected challenge that your team can be affected to. Uh, innovation because the team is part uh, of the decision and he is uh, encouraged to participate actively inside the company with their ideas without going through a rigid hierarchy. And self-management, well, because teams organize themselves and that promote a greater accountability and a better sense of belonging to the company they work in. Obviously, there are some cons to that too. Uh, some of that can be potential chaos because, well, the lack of a rigid hierarchical structure could lead to a perception of chaos sometimes, especially in crisis situation. And a lack of clear direction because, well, if we don't know the vision of the company, uh, for sure we can lose the strategic direction and not giving the right value to the business we are, we are working with. But we can fix that mixing a bunch of bureaucracy, the classical system we use now in our company because, mm, well, only a seat deals in absolute and we don't have to take things as they are but uh, take the best from them if we, want, if we can. So in Adocracy, the team uh, is encouraged to take calculated risk and that philosophy is celebrated. Uh, that leads to more innovation, to not be afraid to do mistakes. And uh, it requires a different approach. This approach requires a, a significant trust in the other team members and the culture embrace change as an opportunity and not as a street. This type of organization in my case has greatly improved communication and the sense of belonging to the company context. And we also had some various improvement in, in after a bit of use of the system. Just to mention a bit of them, uh, we transitioned to 
uh, modern uh, and up-to-date technologies because uh, we want to use new technology with the team and uh, that reduces a lot the development times and improved the dev developer experience uh, we also improved the bug fixing process by integrating some tools that uh, we postponed a lot of time and that helped a lot by fixing bug much faster uh, improving our product knowledge and had a clear vision of what our uh, user are doing on our software. The development of features uh, now goes beyond the business requirements because having a product knowledge more, uh, having more product knowledge of what you are doing can help us to take decision on what our feature must be uh, developed. And that's, uh, it's clearly recognized by our clients. And that uh, also lead to an acquisition of bigger and well-known clients that obviously it's uh, good uh, for our team because we feel uh, more, we, we feel that we are doing something great and we can pursue our target with much more uh, happiness in general. Obviously, uh, it's not always roses and flowers, but we are just getting started and the results are pretty clear until now. Rome wasn't built in a day, that's, that's true, and an empowered team neither. So uh, a clear vision, determination, humor, because yeah, that's really important in, in a team to be more less stressed and uh, more friends also, and adaptability. Speaking of adaptability, uh, let's move to a concept, experimentation. Well, experimentation is the glue that holds together a democracy and an empowered product team. Why that? Because uh, just as ancient Roman engineers experimented a lot to improve their uh, building construction technique, uh, they, 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 lead to, they, they took us a lot of uh, technologies that still we use today. Uh, our team needs to uh, take ideas and process them to grow and thrive in an evol uh, evolving digital world. Experimenting is it's, it's a really important thing. Now I have uh, another question for you. So... Have you ever had an idea in your workplace and never had the chance to develop it? Not limited to dev stuff, but also process and tips, everything. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, experimentation is not just for developer. It extends to any part of companies, uh, from designer to marketer to administrator, because everyone is a resource and uh, experimentation open the door to a constant flow of new ideas that transform the way we work. So now I want to share with you a small concept I'm working, um, I'm de still developing. It's not nothing really uh, wow, but it's an idea we can discuss and can help someone maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so this is Spritz. What's Spritz? Uh, imagine having a micro group of four or five people in uh, the organization rotating every week with a sort of matchmaking system, uh, like when you play games. And they are randomly taken or with any behavior we want to, to use. And this person will receive a starting concept, an embryonic idea to work on during the week. So during the week, they will work on this idea and experiment it with that. Uh, and this is uh, extended to hold the companies. Which advantages can that lead to? Well, for sure, different perspective, because uh, when a lot of people with different knowledge are together and they must work on something, they for sure will bring their own ideas on the table and this can lead to, to, to great things. Micro ideas system because uh, 
we have only one week to work on this stuff as a team. So you can't do much, but these little things can help the process in, in, in your company uh, if apply it to the right context. Proactivity, because, well, your team will learn to uh, innovate, to work on his ideas in, uh, his, with their talents, and that can lead to uh, better proactivity and communication because well if you put five people together they have to to communicate in some way <laughs> so in short is a slightly different aperitif will be nice mixed with some with a, a good spritz in the meantime during the process <laughs> so now we come to the end of our journey and i wanted to give you a little final food for thought one of those cool, impactful phrases, you know? So, in the digital world, AI is constantly growing, but we humans, we must, uh, we have a distinctive advantages. The ability to build, build new roads, just as your Roman ancient friends did thousands of years ago, because without roads, we are not better than machines. And, Thank you for today, for sharing this journey with me. I hope I have inspired you just a little bit also and maybe entertained you. I'm Giuseppe Torre, front-end team lead at Ineo. Things improvise, I want to be grow actor, grow actor, uh, actor, product dev, and something else. Those are my social links if we want to communicate with me and discuss about something. I want to thank the Hendrome organization and uh, all the people here for this beautiful experience. It's my first keynote and wow, <laughs> it's such an amazing experience. And yeah, mm, may Rome be with you. <laughs> That's it. Hey, okay, um, they're just arriving. All right. Mm -hmm. Sit whatever you want. I'll sit on this side. Come. Okay, so um, yeah, let's start and they will set up some background on us. So, uh, of course, thank you. First, first thing, okay. And um, yeah, I do have a, um, uh, I mean, a, um, let, let's start from a, uh, with a question from the audience, then we will we will see. Okay, and uh, I mean the first one, of course, because of security is an interesting topic. I will say. I mean, yes. it, it attracts a lot of interest, and uh, so um, there is one which is: um, Does cross-site forgery attacks get prevented by coarse amplified requests? If I'm right, can you compare your cookie solution with cross-site? Uh, I mean, with coarse. I mean, of course, domain verification is a part of all of that, right? Yes. Yes, for sure. Now, you are correct. Um, whenever you add cores, you are lowering security, right? So the more that you don't allow that cross-origin request, it helps. However, um, that's when a, you make a call into the API. So you still can be passing around a cookie, um, to other sites that do allow you to call it. So you do want to make sure you have that protection against the cookie as well. Yeah, true, true. So from stuff coming in, 
and also yeah uh, probably should be you know not our responsibility to check how the server is actually issuing the cookie and where it's validated so we should you know protect the most more of the parts of course right yeah, yeah. and so um yeah um on the other side uh, and that's for for you right uh we, we talked a lot about triggers right and yeah and so the audience is asking can we actually uh, do a trigger um with cron jobs in azure functions or timing yeah 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 uh, yes one of the basic trigger you have in the basic uh, i mean uh, uh you have in the actual, the, the, the set of the trigger you have, uh, there is a timer trigger. Timer trigger is based on cron tab uh, signature. So you can start, for example, every Monday at seven in the in the morning and so on. So you, you have the timer trigger uh, in, with the other. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, uh, yeah, uh, so the, the other thing is that, um, you know, I, I mean, this is again for you, I'm sorry, but, you know, interesting topic. And, and the thing is that um, we as developers tend, tend to, you know, install a lot of packages, right, with uh, Angular, and then we rarely update them or rarely uh, try, you know, to go ahead with the warnings that we had. You, sh you should have, uh, you should fix these 25 unsecured packages, right? And all of us is like, yeah, but that's, client side why why should i care right yeah so what, what's your take on that yes you should absolutely be verifying your um your packages and your dependencies and um as you had mentioned that you can find out which which one of your dependencies have vulnerabilities by running like npm audit on it and it's going to tell you which has uh, like in the severity level you could still be setting yourself up for um for attacks based off of your the libraries that you depend on, right? So you might be adding in all of these security checks within Angular, but if you brought in some, let's say some random, not so great uh, library into your system, you've made yourself vulnerable. So you want to avoid doing that um, by using really high quality libraries, but then you also want to make sure that you're updating properly Personally, I like to use um, NPM CI. I think there's a yarn equivalent when every time I do installations because that will use the package locks version. So if you use NPMI, it automatically updates to the latest that your Sember allows, which might mean that you've made yourself vulnerable to a potential uh, problem with uh, your change exactly. You might have a supply chain issue or you might even be bringing in something that you didn't expect, right? So. Uh, yes, maintaining and keeping up to date is crucially important. It's actually on the OWASP top 10, like number eight, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, regarding the npm CI command, uh, which is something that, uh, I mean, I, I'll give you my take in this, but uh, it's something that is mislooked a lot of times. And also not committing the package lock and all these kind of things, that sucks a lot. And uh, so it's something you should, you know, start taking care and, uh, you know, working. And I, over, I have seen in some specific projects also the fact that you are kind of, you know, hosting your packages, even though they come from somewhere else. Yes. to protect yeah yep that's actually sorry that's actually a really great idea if you have concerns about your supply chain um, of packages and you can also do uh, checks right so you can have your own um, like repository manager um, and you can determine which ones that you want to allow and in including which versions of those packages you want to allow and you can also make sure you check signatures as well uh, like npm and yarn both support that to make sure that you are getting an authentic version yeah Thank you for that. And so, um, yeah, just have, I have a question for, for you, yeah. yeah, from the audience. It's uh, what are the most relevant goals you got from a sprint session? Uh, how did it change the way you were working? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, we, we like the idea of sprints, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how can it change? Mm. Yeah, the relevant goals. Relevant? <laughs> yeah, the relevant goals of the sprint session. Yeah, what are the relevant goals of sprint session? Well, uh, the point is to uh, connect people in companies that mm, sometimes never meet. Uh, also in smaller companies sometimes, in bigger I think it's more relevant. Uh, they will never talk usually, so they will never share their thoughts together and mm, participate in building a 
good communication and create new ideas, new innovation, and just change some process sometimes can lead to, to great things. Basically, that's the, the target, the, the target of spritz, how we should work a spritz session. And also make more friends. <laughs> Yeah, and drink. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I that's important. And we we try to do that with community. We, uh, me and Lucian and the other guys here met because we did community together to you know ask some things. So if you try to build that culture also internally with you know getting people together, I think you will definitely have a positive impact, right? So, and um, yeah, Massimo, I do have a question for you. Uh, the thing is that. Um, as developers on front end, most of the time we have issues on you know having something on the back end to test what we do. So most of us probably use Mocio or service that will mock something for us. Um, do you see something useful that we could do with the stuff that you showed us in order you know, to have you know, better testability of our applications? Yeah, yeah. the question I don't, I don't understand if, if uh, it is related to the testing about the function or about the, the, the code inside the function, or you mean the testing about the Mock, uh, mocking the API. Yeah, mocking, I mean, giving developers the ability to test yeah. things. Yeah. The stuff that you are showing. Uh, it's uh, another question. No, it's <laughs> no, it's not an easy question because if you simplify, if you have a front end, a back end, uh, if you use a function, uh, probably you are join the two li layer. If you if you need to mock up or substitute the, the behavior of DPI, probably you need to introduce a layer. There are several several layers you can service, you can find in the, in, the, in the world. You put a facade in front of your front end, yeah, back on your front end, in front of your API, then you can say, hey, uh, with this API, with, from, from this endpoint, you answer a, a, a mock you, a, a, a JSON, a standard JSON, so you can start testing your API, your, your, your front end, while I'm preparing the API. When the API is testing and for function, for example, it's easy because it's a just a, a method. So, and uh, uh, you need to, uh, I, 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 I say an Italian word now, you need to make a pork around if you want to <laughs> make your, your, <laughs> your function uh, not testable. Uh, I, I trust you, I'm, I'm, I'm a C-sharp developer, the problem is the same. People try to, to find some shortcut to implement something. In the function, it's very, very difficult. You need to, to create a pork around to, to make something similar. So first, if you decouple the layer, maybe a solution. Second, you need to find a, a, a framework. I don't mean, I don't talk about function. Every framework you want that give you from the base, the testability, because otherwise it's, uh, the effort you need to implement, uh, you will need to uh, uh, make uh, to implement a testable function generally is uh, not applied because, uh, because your function needs for yesterday. So you don't have the time to implement uh, something that are good. So you make the pork around and then uh, you introduce one pork around, your uh, software is not testable. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. Well, daily life. And <laughs> Yeah, at least we have another question for you. Uh, yeah, it's um, okay. So, what are the best practices when it comes to access token management in SPA? And can we briefly recap the do's and don'ts if you have a list? Yep. Sure. Um, we'll start with the uh, the most high level broad one, and which is don't use passwords because it's really, really vulnerable. So you should be having uh, other sorts of elevated mechanisms, ideally phishing resistant authentication. So with after that, I'd recommend it using industry recommended um, standards of OAuth 2.0 and OpenID Connect for authorization and authentication and using a reputable identity provider to make that, uh, to handle your user's identities and authentication for you. Reputable identity providers, like there's all sorts, right? There's paid versions, and there's Okta, there's Auth0, there's more, as well as open source ones. It really doesn't matter as long as it's reputable and they conform to those standards. Now, with that, um, for SPAs, when you use uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2.0, you should be using 
an OAuth flow called authorization code flow with the proof key for code exchange, so Pixie. Always use that. Previously, there was another recommendation, but browser standards have updated enough to support this, so you should always use authorization code with Pixie. And I'll also point out that's even for any web apps, that's even for like a traditional server rendered application, always use Pixie. Um, and then now there was, the now you have the tokens. Yes. yes. So now that we have the tokens, um, the, what is the, the recommendation they're yeah, asking if for? There are do and don'ts for uh, how we should manage the token that we receive. Okay. So um, this is really an interesting thing. So there's a couple of things to think about. So you have two tokens. You're going to have the OID, you're going to have the one from the OIDC, which is your identity token, your ID token, and you're going to have your access token from your OAuth2 for authorization. The access token, um, you usually send it to the back end to make API calls. You want to make sure you're protecting that token and not passing it around to willy-nilly to anybody, right? So only send it to the allowed origins that you expect to use that access token for, protect it, because that gives people a front door right into your application to perform actions as you. So you don't, you don't want to make sure that you are um, only sending that to allowed origins. You should have really short um, lifetime on this too. I should point out, I've talked to a couple of people who had a little bit longer lifetimes and I had was a little surprised. Shorter is better. Um, and then in terms of the token management, which is I'm wondering this is where this is going, where do you store it? Um, there's actually a OAuth spec coming out about this. So yay, finally we're gonna get some really good recommendation. It is in the works. I actually reviewed it just recently. Uh, so I know it's coming out. Um, so stay tuned that there are a couple different ways to manage this and uh, it should be really interesting when it's all done. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, good insights. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that we, I, I've seen people dealing with that in so many ways yeah. it, and it's terrible. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And because you, you don't, I mean, if you're not aware of the, what, what's happening when you have that token, I mean, people will just, you know, treat it as a non so confidential thing or yeah. they are not even aware of where it's been sent right. or stored. So, yeah, we should we should follow what's happening now. Yeah. So um, yeah, I have another question for you from the audience. It's uh, can you trigger an user function by uploading a file to a certain OneDrive folder and then have, have access to it inside the function? I mean, yes. okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, if we talk about OneDrive, uh, we don't have a trigger for the Azure function. But fortunately, we have another serverless technology in Azure called the Logic App. Uh, it, is, it is similar, but I know we are developers, so we don't like Logic App because while the function is called the Logic App is designer, is a, a flow you can create, is a workflow you can create. Uh, Gra graphically, so you put some action. But the interesting thing in Logic App is that you have uh, 400 connectors. Uh, for example, if you need to take uh, data from OneDrive, you have. If you need to take uh, data from Oracle, SAP, and I don't know, DB2, um, AWS, yes, I am in Microsoft. I uh, say AWS and nothing happened, so it's okay. So the idea is uh, you have a technology driven by code, yeah, but you have less uh, trigger. So uh, basic operation like HTTP trigger, uh, timer trigger, or uh, react when someone writes in the storage. Storage is not OneDrive, or uh, for example, Kafka. If you go high level, so you need to manage uh, Office 365 or uh, uh, Google Mail, or I don't know, something similar, probably you need to use another technology, Logic App. The pricing is the same, you pay only for the execution. And of course, you, need, you, you can combine both. So for example, you need to make a calculation. It's not good to make in Logic App because you don't have a code. We like code. So Logic App can call a function, retrieve the data, and I don't know, something similar. So the answer, just to recap, you need to react about a modification in OneDrive. The function is not the good approach. You can use Logic App, and then if you want, you can call a function. I see. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, Joseph, I do have a question for you. And uh, what are the you know the technologies and the things you're using in your team? And now we actually you you know on a daily basis you actually uh, work with them because I think you 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 get a lot of ideas now. You should actually do development in your team. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, we're we're using updated technology. Like we are just updating to Angular 17 right now. Uh, it will give us a lot of new improvements. Uh, also on the backend side, uh, we use .NET, and that's that's <laughs> yeah. And we are uh, also uh, switching to integrate. Uh, uh, a bunch of analytics tools that uh, give us the power to uh, understand well our product, uh, how it works, and uh, understand the product knowledge, how, uh, what to develop first. Uh, so yeah, basically, um, analytics are important. Obviously, they are uh, GDPR compliant. <laughs> compliant. <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, so mainly this, and we sometimes use external service, uh, integrate external service, because uh, in the business environment, you have to be faster sometimes, so you can't always develop your own solution. That's, that's basically how we manage things. And we as a team decide uh, which technology to use and bypassing the hierarchical structure that sometimes lead to uh, slow time in in developing. Okay. That's it. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the take. Yeah. And um, so um, I, I, another question is that's, yeah, that's for you. And um, I mean, you, you share some content on how we should learn uh, the basics, I would say, for security. Right. So, um, is there any, anything that you should, you know, prioritize for people that because most of the people sometimes have, you know, fixed visions like there is who does the UI in the front end, there is who does the integration of the back end, the front end, and so things, which frankly I see it creates a lot of, you know, uh, can create frictions. So, is uh, to create a, this basic knowledge that is shared with everyone, what are the basic concepts or at least resources that we should uh, go and check? Yeah, so um, I want to point out this idea of it's like a more secure first approach to software development application, just like creating applications at all, is now for the first time on the OWASP top 10 because they recognize the need that security has to come earlier in the process and it has to be everybody's responsibility, right? It's not just the application developer. It has to start from the design and from the business analysis. So with that said, I think for developers, um, I would start by looking at the uh, um, at the OWASP. Um, I, I shared some uh, um, like uh, uh, links. Uh, I would look at OWASP though because there's really a lot of uh, great information in there. The OWASP top ten is uh, is nice, but it gets into a lot of details. There's actually another project they have called the Cheat Sheet series, which is really targeted for developers specifically, and it just gives you just what you need about these different topics. Um, that's probably a good one um, to start okay. with if you're just learning about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, that's a question for for all of us because you have you know uh, achieved different parts in your career and you have seen different things and also a lot of evolution in yeah, in uh, in the frameworks that you're probably using and probably use a lot of things that you're not using now and that will be in the future. So who knows? So. Um, What's your best suggestion for people that want, you know, in the team that is developing actually keep up with the, all these new new things and, uh, you, you know, try on the one side to specialize, but also on the other side to be open to the new things, because that's, I think, one of the challenges that we all of us have, right? I'll start from you and then we, yeah, do you have something in mind if you want? Yeah. Sure, I will try to take this. I, first of all, I want to say I have a lot of empathy um, for for all of us, but especially for developers who are trying to keep up with all the different things that are coming out. And I don't mean just within Angular, right? I mean everywhere. There's a lot of technologies, a lot of best practices, a lot of things that you have to be aware of. And I empathize that it is a lot to keep up with. Um, in terms of um, being able to do that, for me, I really like taking a look at... Um, the different social accounts for the different projects I'm interested in, because that's where I'll get like a high level, oh, here's like just a small snippet of something I need to know. So you get that that breadth of information. And then if there's something you need to dive in deeper, then you can go deeper, right, for into a depth. So um, 
for me, I personally find that just kind of getting the lay of the landscape of what is out there, which is where I'm, I usually need to start. Like what's even out there before then I start understanding, oh, I need to really dive a little bit deeper into, into this. And conferences are a good way to hear about that too um, when you attend them, right? But you get a lot of different perspectives that day. Yeah. Thank you. You have something to add? Yeah, my advice. I think uh, um, when I approach, I, I I can say I can say you what I made uh, when what I do when I arrive to a new technology. Just uh, because I think is a, uh, I cannot I cannot imagine what you do, but I can say what I do. So the first uh, approach uh, in, in my career in my in, in the past uh, community was uh, important because uh, for several years uh, starting from. 29, I manage a couple of communities here in Rome, .NET community, of course, Microsoft community. And every time we organize, I know, uh, this, is my, this is my job, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I cannot do, I, I live here, this is my job. Yeah, but, uh, um, and also Luca can, uh, can, uh, can say the same. Every time we organize a meetup, uh, uh, even if we are, if we were three people, five people, there were an exchange of knowledge or uh, at least uh, some int that give you the new step you can uh, uh, go out and go, go up and, and then new um, no new technology. Practically now what I suggest if you want to know more about our technologies, I don't know the other provider, but our technology, if you go on the learn, learn um, website, you can find a lot of uh, learning path it's they are easy so they are perfect if you want to start with technology then i agree with uh, with their social networks uh, some accounts in the social you can follow and of course videos and so on but i suggest if you need to uh, learn a new technology our technology start from learning path because uh, they are thinking for people that arrive on that technology give you some means and then you can find a lot of a, a path uh, to to go. Uh, I just said, mm, I don't have the expertise of uh, other people here. I'm pretty young, but uh, in my daily routine, when I uh, keep up with new technology, uh, I usually my routine is reading a bunch of articles on Dev2, always to, to be updated with latest news and uh, every day I go on Product Hunt watching what's happening in software uh, today and uh, keeping taking up some inspiration from, from them or new things that we can uh, implement, uh, ideas, everything. Yep. Just that. Okay. Yep. Cool. And uh, uh, this question has arrived, unfortunately. <laughs> and that's to you again. And that's for you. And that's kind of <laughs> annoying. And how we can actually monitor or at least analyze if our code base is safe or you know that we should take some actions yeah so there's several different ways you can analyze one of them is running like the npm audit right making sure that your dependencies um, are up to date there's also some um testing tools that are out there that will help you um identify vulnerabilities. Uh, OWASP has them. I think it's like OWASP Zap um, has a, a project out. There's other ones as well that you can uh, um, that you can try running against to do automated testing. Um, it's it's tough. I mean, another one is, of course, if you really need it, is get an audit, right? Yeah. If you if your application requires that level of scrutiny, then um, definitely do so. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. And I mean, making a parallel with that. Uh, how are actually in your team looking at the uh, code quality, let's say? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, we use normal uh, PR and uh, we still doesn't have a very big team, so it's easily to um, stay up to date and correct them, uh, correct people in the team. Uh, everyone watch the PR of of others, basically, I think. Uh, code quality is not always the best, I think, because uh, we are... Everything is needed for guests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah sometimes you have to to make a deal if you want to go very fast or uh take your time and build a lot of quality uh we can stay in the middle sometimes and just try to do booth mm, and just when we we are more launched with the product we can uh starting uh improving the code quality um, of things that really we really need in the product okay. <laughs> yeah no I, I i like the fact that you said the, the the real thing that we need in the product because it means that you can actually still shape and change it which is something that's important but i'm i mean my personally i'm on the opposite so i think solid basis first and uh, so few few things that work very well and are very very good quality but the thing is that if you do things standardized and follow just what's actually you know stated for you know use the component in this way use services in this way you will actually have a lot of you know improvements as you mentioned for security so the framework is doing that for granted and we should take a lot of advantages for that so yeah so um guys i do uh, i think we we, we finish it with this session and we can go to the coffee break afterwards we will have two talks uh, on the ai and then uh, one is the closing key and then yeah, panel, and then we will finish the day. So thank you for your time. Pro, okay. Okay, guys, the coffee break is going to be ready in uh, four or five minutes. So if you want to go out, it's fine. Just to give you an update, we have just three tickets left with this discount code, so just hurry up, okay? Thank you.
of the generative AI at Google, which is Palm Tool. That will be the same as GPT in uh, OpenAI. And then we have uh, Vertex AI, which is the AI platform, which I was talking about. And then we have Duet AI. So Duet AI is part of the second generation. Maybe you have been stuck in the first generation, which is just a prompt and an output and a single interaction. With Duet AI, we have an AI that can run actions, that can execute actions, that has access to tools and APIs. So it's more or less like ChatGPT woke up in the morning and went to work at the office. So this is not, this is not like the casual entertaining, let's create a song of uh, Donald Trump, <laughs> but now we are working. So now we are going to execute some code. We are going to create some spreadsheets, and we are going to create a meeting uh, appointment. So that's the Duet AI. The same capabilities, but within the tool, and the AI can execute actions, which is much more interesting. We all know generalist AI, which is the AI that was trained with information from the internet with Wikipedia, with uh, public availability, uh, books. But of course, that is that gives you that far. If you want to get better results, you need to get domain-specific information, like quality information, not from the internet. And this is an, an example. So we have a specific uh, models that are being trained with quality data around, in this case, medicine. And this is a state of the art. So we have MedPalm, and that can be used for medical purposes. And in the same uh, theme, we also have a specific uh, model for security, and this is SecPalm. As you can see, they are not very original. <laughs> so it's MedPalm, Security Palm, and uh, we can see the patterns here. So it's basically Palm, the same transformer, but changing the training data to a specifically one domain. And of course, if you want to build seriously in that space, you want probably to train your model with uh, quality data. That's going to be one of the things you should consider. Um, from these generative models, one of the things that we realize is that these models can literally speak more than 100 languages, which is like nothing we have seen before. And that means that in the near future, we are probably going to be seeing this multi-language, like more than 100 language support in many tools that we use every day. So for example, if we use uh, Google Meet, we will be seeing like live translations with uh, maybe not so uh, mainstream languages. And maybe finally, you will be able to interact with the English uh, world. Uh, here in Italy. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is fantastic news because it's the same in Spain. And I'm from Barcelona, so I know. And there's a lot of content that is created in English, but that never gets to the Spanish people. And unless you go and look for this content, uh, it just doesn't, doesn't get you. So this is an interesting uh, development. And then, of course, uh, from Google I.O., one of the main topics that was discussed is, of course, responsible use of AI. And these are the principles uh, that Google has created for that purpose. And basically, is all of the good things that we want to make sure that AI is covering, and also the things that we don't want AI to be doing. So if this is broken, probably Google is going to shut down your services if some of these principles are not followed, if you are building using Google technology. <laughs> All right. This is uh, the reactions I can see in the room. There was another event. This is end of August. And see, similarly to Google I.O., this is Google Cloud Year event, which is called Next. And you can see the main products there were Vertex AI and Duet AI. I'm going to share some of the news that were and updates that were shared. And 
Now we are moving into Google Cloud, and this is Vertex AI. There's a lot of names, but I mean, this is uh, all of the new products from, uh, from Google. And yeah, while using Google Cloud, now with Generative AI, with Vertex AI, we have access not only to Palm foundational models, but also open source models. And here in the model garden, we have access, depending on what AI feature we want to add to our application, we can select the best model to do the job. The foundational models in Vertex AI, they go quite far. We have Palm for text and Palm for chat, but we also have a specific models for code, voice and vision. As you can see at the bottom, these are the code names for all these models. So a lot of these models, they are not, uh, maybe not so much talk about, I would say that uh, if you haven't checked what is happening in this space, I would look into voice and vision, which is uh, maybe not so much covered. And then there were new versions of these models. Uh, that was end of August. So there's a new um, larger models uh, family. And the new family has more context, which is called uh, how much you can add to the input. When you do, uh, when you run a prompt, and you can see the difference. So we went from eight k, uh, eight thousand tokens, which is more or less twelve page, twelve pages documents, to forty eight, which is quite quite more. And then of course there's a specific um, flavors of Duet AI. This one is for Google Cloud. So now while you are developing for Google Cloud, you will get the same experience as you get with ChatGPT, but within the tooling. That means that Duet AI knows how to deploy things into the cloud and knows how to run um, the code that you are executing. And in this example, is doing a translation from C++ to Go, which probably in the past would have taken you maybe a couple of days. Some interesting developments. Google recently has committed to any customers using Vertex AI and Generative AI to protect the training data and the generated outputs. So that means if you are building using Vertex AI, you are protected if someone thinks that maybe the content that you are creating may be uh, having a, an IP infringement, a copyright infringement. So Google will send a team of lawyers to protect you against this kind of attack, which could be a risk that you don't want maybe uh, to face. So this is quite cool, I believe. Yes. So this is a, a question that a lot of people is starting to make because these models are basically using uh, calculations, like intense calculations around uh, math, uh, a lot of people say that they are stochastic parrots, which is basically crunching numbers and getting uh, uh, the outputs. Or some people, they are also suspect that we are maybe facing some kind of AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, like some initial versions of it. Let's see how the training works. So here, if we look at the training of um, these models, it works in this way. It's just trying to guess the next word. And this is unsupervised training. You can just give it a lot of data, which could be, in this example, is a Wikipedia article. And you don't need to do anything. You can just give it the input, and the model can start the training. And this is how it works. So it gets the, the input, and it starts taking token by token. It starts with the first token, so that's uh, the beginning. And then it will try to guess the second token. What's next? No, Christopher is. Well, that is not the answer because we can see the model can now look at the next token, which is Columbus, and autocorrect itself. So it's a little game of guess and miss a match. So here is going to now use that information to change the weights, which are the parameters in within the model, to now take a little bit of the probability of after Christopher 
giving you the token is. It's not the token is, it's Columbus. So it needs to raise that probability for Columbus and lower the probability of is. That's the same now. We take the next token and try to guess the next one. In this case, it's Christopher Columbus. The model thinks like, okay, what can go next? Let's try was, which is not a bad guess, but it's not the correct one because we know that from the input is discovered. At some point, the model, because it has so many tokens now, it will start guessing correctly. One thing that you need to take into account is that the model corrects internally all the time. It doesn't matter if it's correct or incorrect because it's just adjusting the probabilities. So if it's correct for America, it's increasing the probability for America. If it's a failure, it just lowers the probability, but it's always changing the weights. So for the model, it doesn't matter if it's correct or not because it's always doing work. And it gets better and better, and then it finishes with the dot. And that's it. You do this 50 billion of times, and then you stop the trading, and then you have a model. So there's, uh, there's not much to it. One way we can look into this training is this hyperdimensional graph, which is creating the relations between the different tokens. And as we see these tokens more and more, the relationships, some relationships become stronger, more probable, and some become less probable, which is then less uh, strong. For Palm, we have two, we have 768 dimensions, and we can represent this, what is called a latent space, with an array. This array is more like a coordinate, a coordinate system. So that will give us a position, which instead of being like three coordinates, it's 768 coordinates, which is like the hyperdimensional. It's a, a lot of dimensions. But the weights are just giving you an idea of how much the token is related to the rest of the tokens. We can see different examples and how the different relationships are represented. If we look at uh, data corpus, and this one is all the captions for Lion, which is a, a data set uh, for images and um, the text used uh, for those images, we can see that when we do this training, some of the data get into some clusters. And here we can see a specific cluster around foot pictures. So when you're doing a prom, what you are actually doing is locating yourself within that latent space around this uh, area, in this case, foot. But look at the shape. It's very dense, it's very condensed, there's no much, not much noise. If we look at another area of this latent space, we can see this other side of, uh, of the picture, and this is individual celebrities, which is uh, a little bit different. So not the density and also the noise in between this data. This is just to get you familiar with the latent space and what happens after the training has finished. Something don't worry. Because of the way the training works, it gets biased. That means that it's biased depending on the training data. I mean, if we used information from Wikipedia, the authors of the articles, some way their opinions are embedded in that uh, model. And then, of course, because we are generating new content, it can get non-factual. Not everything that ChatGPT tells you or Bart tells you is uh, true. Um, and then we also realize that these models are not accurate. So if you try to do some calculations, it most probably will fail. So what people are trying to do now, they call it grounding, which is trying to double check the facts. And one way you can do it is running Google searches, having vector databases with uh, embeddings, with uh, your private data so you can uh, contrast that information. Or also, I don't know if you're familiar with this, the Google Knowledge Graph is the metadata that sometimes you can see on a Google search on the right side. So that could be like the age of a celebrity, if it's married, if it's not married, all that metadata comes in the shape of a graph. 
and some models have access to it. <laughs> okay, look at the pizza. I'm trying to get your attention. So let's look at BART, and this is the entry point which I recommend you. Uh, if you haven't checked recently, it has changed a lot, and BART is quite advanced because it has a lot of features today, and it has access to Google search, so BART can decide if it needs to run a Google search. It can uh, access to the Google Knowledge Graph, run code in a Python sandbox, or also have access to uh, session memory. Some other features that BART has uh, added is access to Google Lens. I don't know if you are using this, if you uh, have it in your phone. That will give BART information around what is on a picture and the information then you can use it to generate your prompts. Some examples here. You can use Google Lens to, for example, send a picture of a butterfly and get what kind of butterfly it is or you can get more creative and do a picture of some ingredients in your kitchen and it will propose some recipes. Something more practical. Who wants to try this? You do a screenshot of a, of a form and then ask Bar to create, <laughs> to create an Angular component that will recreate that form. That actually works. And um, you can also ask for different uh, options. Some other interesting things that you can do today as they add more and more features is that you can uh, plot different functions and also iterate over them. An interesting development is BART extensions. And here you can see some examples. Now BART has access to Google Drive Google Maps, Gmail, listen again, Gmail, <laughs> and all the different tools from Google. So what can you do is pretty awesome. You can just go and ask something as general as, because I do a lot of conferences, I ask for the specific agenda and then just mention the name of the conference. And the only thing you need to use is the at, at Gmail, at YouTube, depending of the, the, of the extension. And Bart will look into your email. Of course, you need to give it permission. And, uh, and then it will just uh, do a search or it will try to find the information and give it, give it back to you. It's quite, it's quite cool. Another thing you can do is, uh, of course, because Google has uh, access to YouTube, it will give you access to uh, the transcripts from videos and other things which are worth, worth your try. We are getting back to the business. And this is a, when we want to develop. So imagine you have an idea and you want to develop it using Angular. The first thing you will have to uh, try is Maker Suite, where you can practice different prompts and then get the code that you can move into your app. So if we look at the UI, it looks more or less like this. You have different options to create your prompts and uh, refine the feature you want to build. And here we have an example. So if you are a content creator, you can take the content of one of your blog posts and you can ask Palm to imitate your own writing style. And then once you have your writing style, you can create more content using exactly your tone and your style of writing. I, I never use this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another example, which I guess is, is, is very fitting for Italy. You can create a cooking assistant and call it Chef Marco. And I don't know if you can see how that would work, but you create a context which gives the model a little bit of a background story and what you require from it. But you can, you can play with this. It's very similar to the OpenAI Playground. So you can just go here and try different things. The best thing from this uh, interface is that you can go to the top right and you can just grab the code with all the settings and everything and uh, it will just work, which is very quick. Yay! Thank you, Gerard. 
Palm. So a little bit of details from Palm. Palm is very recent. It was just released last April and is a generalist foundation model. You can see some of the training data here. And it has a considerable size. It's maybe a third of what GPT-4 is uh, considered to be. And mainly the question of everyone is like, okay, how it compares to GPT-4, not GPT-4 Turbo, not the last one, but the previous one. And then how it compares to open source. The most representative of open source, I, I pick Llama 2, which is the the standard these days. So you can see that the difference is like very, very close. Right now, I think in six months, you will run these models locally and it will give you the same performance as GPT 3.5. And very soon we will get uh, GPT 4 performance. So the gap is very, uh, is very uh, small. So what you can do with Makersuite is have access to a Palm 2 for text, Palm 2 for chat, um, and also embeddings. This is a little bit of an overview of the landscape. The main difference, if you want to build for front end, is that you only have access to a REST API. And if you are in the back end, you have a client or SDK. So that's a little bit uh, better. For Angular, I built a demo. And the only thing that I had to do is get an API key, and then I was I was set. Main problem today is this is still in beta, so only some countries have access to it. So you need to use a VPN for now for Europe. Um, so that's still not publicly available. All right, let's go into the demo, and we can call it a day. As you can see, I updated everything to version 17. And this is, uh, this is a public repo. So if you want to use it, you can, uh, you can give it a go. Let me just move to the demo. And here you have the live demo. And I have two versions. I have uh, Palm for text, which is this uh, interface. And then I have Palm for chat. So let's start with Palm for text. And the interface is very similar to Maker Suite. I'm going to run this. So that's going to be my input. And Palm 2 is going to generate the continuation of uh, that prompt. And here we can get like a definition for what is generative AI. And I also added 11 labs, which is a generative AI voice. And let's hear it. I don't know if you have realized, but this is an Italian English accent. <laughs> How awesome is that? I mean, the technology is going like super fast. So here for Pound for Chat, the main thing working with generative AI is that the most interaction is text, which is uh, a little bit weird. So you will see yourself when you build these solutions that you will have to deal with renders, different renders. So here's, here's an example of a renderer for Mermaid, and it looks like this. So it's basically Markdown, and using a code fence with Mermaid, I can uh, then find, identify this uh, Markdown, and I can create a renderer specific for that. So some of the different mermaids diagrams that I am using or I'm supporting, and probably this one is the nicest one. Let's enjoy it for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that you can go and build it. You just need, for now, VPN access, and you are set to go. Happy times. Yes, happy dance. I hope I inspired you, and this is how it looks. <laughs> Boom. Well, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. And we will deep dive in the eye.
uh, later in the panel. So continue using the same link for questions. And uh, now I'm welcoming here uh, Natalia Vendito. She's a principal program manager at Microsoft. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. And you, you need to be mic'd. So yeah. give me one second. Yeah, it works. Works, but you need to plug it here so you can also see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, yeah. Because just, just sometimes testing. this is not um, okay. visible. But, yeah. uh, wait, you, you need to. Ah. Uh, right? Don't worry. There is an adapter here. I don't have one. No, we have well, the adapter. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, go ahead and then. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Just need to allow it. Here. Here. Forget it. Yeah. And so, um, Yeah, so um, in our talk, uh, Natalia will uh, show us latest things uh, regarding uh, Azure OpenAI. And um, yeah, we will see a little bit of journey using uh, Azure AI Search, Landchain, and other topics. I don't know if you're aware of them, but they are very, very interesting. So here we go. Yeah, uh, the mic is quite high. Because <laughs> I have my, my mouse here. I'm, oh, I'm okay. Like, yeah. Here. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for having me. First of all, I don't have cats. So if you're waiting for, <laughs> I don't have cats, I don't have gifts, I don't have any of that. But I have this cool robot that I created with a prompt. I basically told uh, being creator, like, give me a T2 looking like robot that. Uh, it's coming out of a holy like splatter of these hexas, and I got the hexas from the angular.dev uh, site, and it got me this. And then I kind of, not very nicely, but you see the angular logo there, and I just put it there, and it looks amazing. Okay, so yeah, I have the hardest slot in the day. Why is it hard? Because First of all, it's a keynote. I never, I'm never sure what a keynote is. Like, I, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do a talk. I'm, I'm just a developer. I'll talk about developer things, and everybody will be happy. Also, like two, two weeks ago, we had Ignite at Microsoft, where many of these technologies that I'm going to be talking about were um, explained in detail, and of course, the recordings are there, and they are made by super top people so you can go and see amazing graphics and explanations but i want to talk about a developer journey because this is what we are how many of you are developers how many of you are angular developers say angular go angular yeah go That's it. i want to bring the energy up because everybody's sleepy okay let's talk about a developer journey so once upon a time, I was like two months ago or three, I don't know. I, I was doing my regular tasks. I, I am a uh, cloud architect and, and application developer, basically, I, and I do developer tools, right? So I wasn't very much concerned about AI back then. So I, I did see the intersection with the AI and everything we did at Microsoft. But I wasn't really thinking, OK, I see where it you know, kind of overlaps with customization for applications and personalization and all these things, recommendation engines. But I wasn't really thinking I had to learn to build anything AI myself, let alone teach or give samples or um, issue best practices and documentation for other developers to do that. And I was wrong. Of course, I was wrong because I, uh, AI, well, it took like a prominent place in our space. As you all know, we have, when we are sleeping, we see AI. When we are coding, we see AI. When we are eating, we see AI everywhere. Like you, you get a box with cosmetics and it's like built for AI. Like <laughs> <laughs> it really is like this, right? 
But I have to admit that for the last couple of years, I've been using Copilot heavily. Who hasn't? Like, who, who, who uses Copilot? Admit it. Everyone uses Copilot. Yeah, it's a good thing. It makes you more productive. I mean, why would we shy away from saying we use Copilot? I do. I use Copilot, and it's amazing. And if you um, combine it with language services, it's a multiplier, right? You, you can get faster. You can get better. You can get suggestions. Some of them don't work. It's OK. But it's fun. And yeah, I, I was using Copilot. And, that was like my first considerable use of AI in my daily work. But again, I wasn't thinking I was going to have to build anything with AI, anything like relevant anyway. But then one day I got call, I got a call from the um, manager of my manager of my manager, like super skip manager here at Microsoft. And they said, like, yeah, we we have this Python sample showing a RAG application. And we realized that we don't have any sample like that for JavaScript developers. And I'm like, yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> RAG. RAG. I was, I was pretending I knew what RAG meant, right? And then I don't know how many of you are uh, like, I, I imagine most of you are very familiar with the community. So there is this, this I asked, of course, I asked Dali to create for me, or actually a uh, Bing creator. And I asked him to create a picture of me and Wasim Shegam. Who knows Wasim from the community? Yeah, super friend of ours. He, he's an, an amazing developer and creator. And I said, like, look, they're asking from us that we build a rack app. And we were like, both of us like Googling RAG. <laughs> um, yeah, OK, so what is RAG? Oh, first of all, why do, I, why, why do I, they ask me to build this? OK, I, I work um, as a lead for JavaScript end-to-end -end developer experience and developer tools. In Azure, that means that if you have a VS Code extension request, if you uh, want to see a service that you deploy JavaScript to in Azure um, provide a certain experience, you talk to me. And I'll try to make it happen. OK, so yeah, and before we get to what is RAG, again, what is in this talk for you well, how many of you have been asked in the past months or weeks to build a um, artificial intelligence application by your customers? Or your bosses have mentioned, you know, we have to start thinking about artificial intelligence. And you're like, I'm a JavaScript developer or an Angular developer. I don't know. Have you been in this situation? Some of you have, of course. We are going to be in this situation more and more. So let's see how I, uh, well, how I solve that problem. Again, RAG, back to the artificial intelligence topic. Retrieval augmented generation. Of course, when you are a JavaScript developer and you see that name, it gets scarier even, right? It's an architecture pattern, right, that comes combines retrieval and generative artificial intelligent models. So what does it mean? It means that you basically have in your architecture a retriever that selects relevant passages of whatever text, in this case, from a data set, and then um, articulates a response from that. OK, now we're ready to build a RAG application, right? Because we know that. <laughs> of course not. And there are so many decisions that we have to make as application developers, particularly if um, our job or role involves deciding the architecture in, or involves deciding the, um, the technical stack. This is true for every application, not only for artificial intelligence applications. 
before we start coding, before we start coding, we have to think about the how, the with what, and the where to. Especially today, because back in the day, we used to, as front-end developers, we used to package our HTML, CSS, JavaScript, give it to a back-end person, they will put it somewhere in a, I don't know, in a code base and deploy it to, to the um, data center that was underneath their desk. But right now we, are, we have to think of the cloud. We have multiple new mechanisms of delivering content, of rendering content. Um, today, earlier in the morning, Alex and Pavel were talking about server-side generation. They, there, were there were other talks about it, about edge compute and different things. And this is why we not only think about the um, with what or how we're going to build our architecture and our application, but also from where we're going to be delivering this content. And then we start thinking more in depth and more specifically about the whole, um, the whole application structure. And we start thinking about APIs, right? Let me go back a little bit. Because I said we have to think about the how we build it. And that means that we probably want to have a good specification of our application. We want to understand how it's going to connect, what 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 is going to be the front end or the user interface, what is going to be in the back end, the services, etc., and how we're going to connect these parts. And we want to have contracts and we want to have schemas and we want to have all these things that make sure that things work correctly. We also want to think about the technical stack, like I mentioned, what are the technologies that are going to be part of it, that we're going to be using to build them. And then also again, back to the part where to run it. And, and, and there, there is no order to this. It's kind of um, an overall thinking move. OK, so again, APIs and AI models in this case, or how things are shaped. We know Rack, but what does that mean more concretely? Well, GPT and large language models are AI models, obviously. Um, large language models uh, and encompass the category of anything that, you know, it's large because it includes up to trillion parameters. Uh, parameters are basically weight and biases, what they call. So the text, the, the volume of data, and their relationships. And then GPT is um, like a subcategory, I could say, of LLMs. Um, if you, let, let me tell you an anecdote. Like, I think it, it was back in June, I was at a Microsoft conference, and we were asked, a group of people asked us, what is GPT? What does it stand for? And none of us could actually respond. <laughs> we were all Microsoft employees because it, it wasn't really part of our daily lives. Like, mm, we think it's, I don't know, maybe this, maybe that. We were wrong. But it's, yeah, generative, generative pre-trained transformers, right? And what does that mean? It means that um, it's a model that learns to predict the next word in a sequence and it start outputting these words as tokens. Um, Gerard was mentioning this capacity that, that uh, models have over time. And of course, as they, they get more evolved, they have more capacity. Uh, I think GPT-4 Turbo we read today, it's 32K tokens. That's a massive amount of context and I don't know if you ever used ChatGPT and you are having a conversation with it. And after a while, it feels like it's, it's getting out of context or it's repeating the same answer or it's no longer in the conversation. It's because it ran out of that, 
or, or it went over that limit of understanding the context of the conversation overall. But they're getting more and more evolved and they're getting more and more capable and that capacity is going to expand over time. Other models are DALI, for example, and for voice, Whisper is another um, technology that allows us to prompt with voice. Okay, so we know RAG, we know LLM, we know uh, GPT. Another thing important for us to know is completions. Again, it's that process of um, generating that next token in the sequence and using it to complete whatever you're doing. We see it in Copilot. We start writing the name of a function and because of the context, it understands more or less how to continue for you, right? And gives you a suggestion. It's predicting, right? It's not that it's thinking how to code anything. It's just predicting what is the best output. And then we have embeddings. This is another important concept or uh, word that we need to understand. And embeddings are the vectorial representation of words, phrases, sentences um, in the continuum vector space. And why in the vector space? And why we, we need embeddings? Actually, these models do not understand words. They do not to understand the relationship between words and the uh, similarity. They do calculations with numbers, in this case, vectors. There are other models, not only vectorials. You can use graphs. You can use text. But even when you use text, you use embeddings, again, because uh, the model needs to calculate with numbers. So I don't know why this happens to me. OK. Other important uh, stuff that we need to know. And you're going to see why we need to, to understand all these concepts when we want to build these applications. We need to understand what a semantic ranker is, semantic captions. Um, basically, it's all about the organization of words, depending on the semantic similarity that we're going to calculate with those vectors that we mentioned before. Um, also, the ability to generate captions gives us a textual description of that calculation. The approach, um, all these generative um, models, they have different types of flow, how you're going to be retrieving that information. Maybe you're going to read first, then you're going to retrieve, then you're going to generate. That is defined by the approach. Um, the retrieval mode, which can be, again, textual, vector, graph, a hybrid model. And finally, the temperature. The temperature is controlling the randomness of the response to an input. Stay here with me. Hey. <laughs> I don't have cats, so I have to do something, <laughs> something different. OK. How do we talk to these models when we are on Azure? We talk using the OpenAI SDK from our backend. Like Gerard explained, there are SDKs that talk, obviously, from a service back to the uh, service running the models. So our service, our written service, to the service um, that is running, in this case, in Azure, all the OpenAI models. Wait, I don't know how many slides I went, I moved. OK. So when you're using the Azure OpenAI SDK, um, basically instantiating or creating a client is as easy as this. You have a .m somewhere where you're going to define some configurations. You obviously have a key. And then you just can um, go new OpenAI client and pass the endpoint, and that's it. You, there is 
basically no complexity to it. The complexity comes in what you do later. And this is why I was explaining you why what all those um, other concepts were, because typically when you post a request to these services, what you do is you pass the context, uh, you pass the, obviously the content, which is a word, uh, the word, the, the question, excuse me, and the role, because this is by turns. So there is a turn that is for the user, a turn that is for the assistant, and so on and so forth. And then again, you want to control those things that we defined earlier, the approach, we want to control the um, ret retrieval mode, if we are going to enable semantic, semantic ranker, if we're going to enable semantic captions, and all this is at Microsoft specified in our chat app protocol, which allows us to exchange backends for um, an open AI application. So the, the um, the chat protocol is not in public preview yet, so I cannot give you the link to it, but it's going to be very, very soon. It's undergoing some, you know, the typical uh, protocolar uh, revisions that we need before making anything public. But again, why we do this is because, like I mentioned very early in the talk, we want to define the uh, how we're going to be building things and we want to have contracts and we want to make sure that everybody is on the same page when building these applications. That allows us to swap a Python backend with a JavaScript one or a Node.js one very easily using exactly the same API endpoints. Okay, beyond this, what is our application architecture? These are some of the decisions we had to make without actually being uh, AI experts. But this is, this is application development and we are used to it and it wasn't that difficult or architecture in the cloud, but still, there you go. We have a front end, we have two microservices. One is an indexer, another one is a search service. We also have, in this case, in our particular case, we are, um, our data set are markdown files. So the indexer is ingesting those markdown files. It's um, putting them in the blob storage and then doing all the magic, like all the indexing. And then when we have a, a an end user hit the front end with a question, it hits the search service that goes to the Azure OpenAI service. And together with the um, Azure AI search, that is the database, the vector database, it uh, responds to the user. We're going to see that in a demo right now. But again, it's important to understand that in this type of applications, we have different data sources. We mentioned vector, we mentioned graph, we mentioned text, which could be a SQL database. And we also need to, um, to use a blob storage type or object storage to do this kind of data massaging or data um, fine tuning. In our case, we're doing it with Langchain. And we decided to go with Langchain because it's one of the favorite frameworks for um, artificial intelligence, particularly RAG applications for JavaScript developers. And basically what we're doing, we're doing, we're doing it in the blob storage context. So yeah. What does the front end look like? This is what everybody wanted to see because I was speaking about back end. How many of you do back end? How many of you do end to end development? Back end, back end, back end, back end, back end? Alex, back end? Yeah. So out of the room. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> now we have them identified. No, just kidding. We love everybody. We are just end to end and Front end. So we have an Angular wrapper, Angular shell. And when we decided to write this chat component, we went with lit because we wanted a 
web standard, uh, web component uh, framework that would allow us to bootstrap that component to any kind of shell as long as it's um, so friendly with web standards as Angular, right? And this is basically how we make them both interact. Uh, so lead has some uh, reactive properties that you can define and set as attributes. And then in the Angular component, which is a standalone component, we just say, okay, you know, React over here. If I change uh, the um, streaming, for example, um, variable, I set it to true, just let's do streaming. And that's as simple as that. We didn't need to do absolutely anything else in order to connect one to the other. I'm going to then uh, give you the link to the, to the repo. How do we manage state? Well, we don't know to which kind of application this chat component is going to be bootstrapped. It can be Angular, but it can be React, it can be Vue, it can be anything. So we don't, we don't and can't be um, prescriptive about the state management. What we do is we decided on a set of events that we're going to emit in order for developers to react in the shell if necessary. And this is how we do it in Angular, just have a um, host listener. And we react to certain events that get published with window.postmessage interface. Do you approve? <laughs> yeah, he says, okay, whatever. If it works for you, it works for me, right? Okay, so of course, that gives you the ability to um, extend that state management or uh, handle it in a different way. Move. Okay, let's go to the demo. Let me see. Is it working? So again, this is, and for you to, to see I'm not lying, this is an Angular 17 app. This is the web component, the, the chat component, the web component that is over there with all this um data attributes so it says like in in this case how to search and book rentals well we have we have a um an a javascript application reference and architecture reference that we built also as an open source sample for javascript developers working on azure and it's a rentals or real estate application and we wanted to connect it to that fictitious uh use case and this is why it speaks about booking and refunds and contact a representative. So what I showed you earlier, there is this indexer service that is taking all this documentation that describes how to, um, how to do all these things. And then the indexer will read it and will apply the models on top of that data. This is a, a very, um, let's say low hanging fruit use case that you can offer to your customers when they come to you and say, I want to use, I want to put AI in my application, but I don't know how a support chatbot. That's, that's like something that it's useful for everyone. It keeps the support um, story up to date and it lets you build these kind of experiences. So basically that's it. Uh, typically, this is uh, using um, 3.5, so it's now thinking, please wait, I am generating the answer, and as you can see, it's, it, it has this, this nice kind of typing um, effect, exactly like the chat GPT one has. This is all, again, open source, you can go grab it and start using it tomorrow. It gives you also some follow-up questions, so you can go on and on. Also, it has citations. It gives you the uh, data points, which allows developers to understand how these answers were generated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OK. So let's go back. 
Where is the presentation? Woo, here. Okay, no cats, but I'm, I'm still going to find ways to catch your attention. So how does this um, response from the backend service to the application works? We are streaming. That's another um, technology that we heard about during the uh, conference today. We started with servers and events. It was kind of difficult to parse them later. We not difficult, but more complex. So we moved to NDJSON. Uh, so that's new line delimited JSON. And what it does is it sends little chunks. So all those tokens, they get sent as one chunk uh, in JSON format. And then we grab them and we parse them, parse them, kind of style them, put them in the in the uh, DOM very nicely. Again, we are teaching you how to do this. If you go to the sample, you have all the code. Um, this is what it looks like in the front end. So we're just using a generator and yielding each one of those chunks. This is how we cancel that stream. So basically you can see over there uh, in the JSON parser stream and how we cancel it and how we also yield each one of those chunks so we can grab them and put them in the front end. And this is what the service looks like in the back end. So basically using just Node.js or JavaScript end to end. Deployment. So again, we, we said everything that runs needs infrastructure, okay? all running software and applications. So of course, if you think there, there, are, um, there are clouds that give you, um, give you less, let's say, Azure gives you a lot of opportunities to change your deployments and, and decide what services you're going to use. That can be a, a little bit overwhelming for JavaScript developers and we know it, especially if we are not coming from a background of operations. So what we're doing in this sample or together with, with this sample is we are providing templates that developers can use with our infrastructure as, um, as code tools in this case, the Azure Developer CLI, you just grab the template that we provide. Even if you build your application with Angular, with, like I mentioned before, vanilla JavaScript, it's going to work nonetheless. And it also um, allows you to deploy all the services, including the Azure uh, OpenAI service and the Azure AI search. I am not going to do it live because when, when you do it in the um, Azure Developer CLI, it shows some uh, keys that, I, of course, I don't want to be to stream. So let's see a video. Let me see, is this a video? I'm going to move it a bit forward because it has some backups, just in case something didn't work. You know the, the guts of demos. But basically what you do is you just run, you grab the template as it is, and you run ACD up. And it, then it will ask you some questions like, what's the region you want to deploy this to? Or uh, what are your keys, etc. But it takes around 10 minutes or 12 minutes to do the deployment of all the services, the Azure OpenAI service, the, um, the Azure AI search, and also all the containers that we are deploying our backend services or microservices to, and the static web app where we are deploying the front end. That, that and the indexing, the ingestion and indexing of the documents all in, approximately 12 minutes. And we're talking about a large volume of documents that the, um, that the system is ingesting. So basically this is it. 
when it finishes, it does the whole build, the whole uh, thing with Angular as well. I think in this in this video, I had to to I I had not um, uh, disabled analytics, and that was a problem. So I had to cut it at some point because it it did interrupt my 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 CD. But then that's that's it. So let me make it a little bit. Uh, what's going on here? I don't see the arrow anymore over here, and it's like it stopped. Yeah, it's over there, but I cannot see it in my. I don't know how to get out. Okay. I don't have a way out. Yeah, it's not escaping it. No, but it's also um, it's also not moving between desktops. Yeah, let's let's do the old trick: plug it and unplug it and plug it again. That always works, right? <laughs> Doesn't no matter what's the problem. Yes, that works. You see. <laughs> okay, so basically. Let's move it towards the end. No. And that's it. It gives you a URL because it does the whole URL provisioning, the whole binding, the whole uh, integration of applications. And once you're done, you just go to the to the provision URL and you are back in the application. So I didn't want to take too long. I don't know. I don't even know how long we went or we ran. If you want to know more about Azure OpenAI and Azure AI search, you can go to the template, uh, to the template, to the, yeah, to the template. It's a template in the end, to the sample and, um, fork it and give us a start, a start as well, and use it and give us uh, feedback. And I have a challenge for you because again, this is in like, I, I opened a pull request not long ago, it's here, and my colleagues are waiting because look at this. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's fun when you push so many changes, but this is to enable the Angular shell. Uh, but I have another challenge for you. If you fork it and actually migrate the chat component to Angular uh, using signals and all the amazing stuff, um, please let us know and we'll make sure to make you famous. And yeah. And if you want to know more about any of these other things, like the uh, development operations, architecture, and many of the concepts of application development that were discussed today during the conference, you can visit my site. By the way, this is very important, ethics. And Gerard also mentioned this. This I took from our inter internal training because it's, I think that nobody can say it better. When we implement artificial intelligence responsibly, we can bring tremendous positive impact for individuals, industries, and society. And don't forget that. Use it very, very responsibly and use it well. So again, if you want to learn more, visit my site. Thank you. That's a wrap. No cut. Are we having the panel? Yeah.
I'm not used to other. Can you? I'm like irresponsive, like my yeah. clicker. Hello. Okay. So thank you guys very much. It was really inspiring, at least for me. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Okay. Before we start with the beep, yeah, this is one for all of us. Okay. You want your own one? <laughs> you want your own? Okay. So. Uh, I have um, a question for both of you about AI in general and uh, how this is affecting developers and um, you know what kind of change is going to put in the you know daily work. Okay. You can start with the lady first. Yeah, you sure, sure. first. So I I know because it it has been brought to me that many and it's, it's obvious that people may be wondering what's going to change for me uh, in the future as a developer cats <laughs> um, what's going to change for me as a developer in in the future and I know people even think about you know uh, not having a job anymore and I Definitely don't think that's the case. What I think uh, or how I see artificial intelligence impacting our jobs is, again, like I mentioned, we are going to get more productive. We're going to spend less time doing some tasks that are really not worth our time and more time actually delivering things, results and things that are uh, are going to cause an impact in our customers and, and, our, and the companies we work for. What I do think is also that as developers, we need to start thinking more about architecture, about integrations, like I mentioned about having a good application design instead of just sitting there and coding and seeing whatever we build, we build. So that's the, that's the change I see. We're going to become more of architects of our applications and better at building our applications with the aid of artificial intelligence. I mean, we have seen the success of um, GitHub Copilot, and I think that's the strongest AI product we have seen in the last, maybe last year. And I mean, the speed it has been adopted by all the developers, it just maybe we haven't seen anything like that uh, recently. And yeah, in the future, I think the easiest next uh, generation is going to be what they call low code or no code. Mm -hmm. So we are going to see more of these tools, which may have a chatbot or an assistant or some sort of uh, help but then of course you can look I mean that's gonna happen first but there's also like okay what's the next iteration and the next and the next and then we look 20 years from now and we have no idea so that's also how different people see the impact of AI I mean, you can see a little bit what's going to happen next, but of course, it's not going to stop in no code and low code. And there's going to be big changes, I think. We were, we were discussing this, uh, the differences between generations, and we probably will see big changes that is difficult to, I mean, it's difficult to imagine, but I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite uh, interesting whatever happens. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question is, what if this kind of technology, they become unavailable for all the people? So how we can democratize 
you know, the development. So what happened is this kind of company decided to set a price on it. And, uh, you know, you start using like this kind of tool and when they say, okay, you have to pay. So what happened, you know, to developers? What, so what do you think? I think. I, I personally <laughs> don't think that would happen uh, because there are so many models and there are so many makers of this type of technologies that there's always going to be uh, availability of it. Of it. Um, but we are developers. So what is the logical reaction we're going to build it, build it right <laughs> so that's that's my take um but anyway the the world is better by having this the ability to to innovate in this way and i don't think that anybody is thinking about blocking that or we we, we want to enable that uh, transformation yeah i i, I mean I tried to show it on my slides. I think that we are going to see a strong open um, open source AI models, and I mean, I don't I don't think that we have enough uh, hardware today. It's not that uh, readily available, but maybe in the future we have quantum uh, computers. I don't know, but. I think it will be more common to have, like, we we'll build our own model, we use our own model, we are not uh, using a, an API. And I think the days for close APIs are accounted now, I think, from the changes in the open source um, development. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask a question from the audience. Uh, why is Bar so difficult to integrate in comparison to ChatGPT? I mean, you can do anything. I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> are we talking with junior developers or what? I mean, you can use anything and you can develop anything. I mean, this is ridiculous. Like, it's difficult. Like, what is difficult? You just get it working. I, I think he's a junior complaining to a, a lead <laughs> developer. Gerard, this is difficult. I mean, okay, then fix it. Uh, okay, it's not one day, it's two days. Okay. I don't think there's any extra complexity. And you can use any API. And if it doesn't work, then you use open source. I mean, I don't see problems. I, I see solutions. And I don't see complexity. I see a challenge. <laughs> and cats. <laughs> Yo, I, I don't know what's uh, okay. I don't know what this is for. So, are you working also on image to image models? In image. In image to image models. Yeah. Ah, image. Image, 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 image generation. Yeah. Image to image. Can I see? Image to image model. Uh, maybe what they mean is uh, presenting somehow an image to a model and that it uh, generates a, a different image. Oh, yeah, okay. probably okay. that's. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know of a specific model at the moment that does that, but probably there is because I, again, I am learning, still learning, for sure there is. Um, but I see no limits. You can you can literally use anything as an input and get the output you define. So I think I, I was a little bit confused for a moment, but the thing is we don't have these models. I mean, there's what is called um, multimodal uh, model that can handle not only text but images audio and other uh, data types. But then, of course, you will have the same multimodality on the output side. So then these models, we haven't seen as many. I mean, there's uh, a lot of research. But I think the only model that we know that may do that could be the model that um, Google is working on, which is uh, the Google uh, Gemini. Uh, model, which is supposed to be, I mean, it's also like a rumor, 
that could be multimodal. And then when you have multimodal, that means that you don't only uh, are limited by text or you know input and output is text or images are uh, input and output images, but you can mix between all of these and the model will understand both or all the multiple types at the same time, which now you need to use separate models. So that's kind of in the making, but there's no many models like that. Good. So I have another question. Uh, you said before that, you know, with AI, we can be more productive. So, but one is why we need to be more productive. So more, more productive. So this is like, you know, if you're a developer, you don't really care about production. It's more aligned on, you know, top le manager level about what you can provide for your customers. So why you are, as a developer should be more productive, especially, you know, people, they get paid the same. So the time that they spend yeah. is... <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Why you want to be more productive? The amount of learning I have done because I had more free time, because I was faster, it's, it's really to my advantage and nobody else's. But also, obviously, you produce more. It's to the advantage of the ones that hire you and then they get you to do more stuff for them and, and stuff that you, you feel good about, right? Um, that's that's my take. At least for me, that's uh, that's how I feel about anything I deliver. That the best it is, or the better it is, and um, and the more I can deliver in less time, the better I feel about my work, uh, even if I get paid the same. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can. It has many many uh, points of view, but I think productivity translates into free time yeah. or productivity translates could also go wrong. Like being more productive can also mean that you are given more tasks uh, in the same time. So that's not a good thing. Um, but it can also mean that you can have more free time. But of course, if you can manage your own time, but someone else is managing your own time, then it gives you more load, more workload, which is terrible, <laughs> then you need to go freelancing. Uh, I don't know. I think, I think we shouldn't be looking at uh, productivity. I mean, we are not owners unless you are uh, you know, a founder or a startup founder. There's not much people as a developer that has this mindset. But of course, if you can do more, I mean, it depends how much you want to do. I mean, I don't know. It's relative. I don't think that's the main driver. I think one driver that can work for developers is automating. So AI, it's very close to automation. Like, how can I, can I automate things? And I think there's something like hooking, like, a, you know, like some kind of a sugar candy that for developers if you can automate something you you are very happy afterwards so i think with ai we are going to be able to automate a lot of things and that's going to make a lot of developers happy thank you very much guys i think that uh, we are done thank you thank you thank and uh, yeah Hey, okay. So now we'll be doing the closing of the conference and then uh, we will set you free, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So we will be staying closing everything. So if you want to help, that's, uh, anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just spend a few seconds again thanking the partners. Uh, of course, Microsoft that is hosting us, but also key partner, ICT Group, uh, Fervento, PAC, Conte, uh, Okta, Sticker Mural, Slido that gave us a lot of tools and things to use today. And so, yeah, great, thank you. And uh, 
yeah, please guys come here. So yeah, we can uh, uh, we can close the session, and I would like to to show you <laughs> <laughs> guys. Wait a second. No, no. <laughs> For non-Italian speakers, that's way to cheer, and uh, you need to know that people behind that this uh, IST group they, they did this this like few minutes ago they're like so excited about you know angular new logo new things and they came out with that and i mean they're great and they are they are sure the passion that all of us are doing in the in the conference they they promised some t-shirt with this logo for next year so <laughs> buy your ticket now what, what does it mean uh, yeah uh, <laughs> Yeah, it can have multiple meanings. It depends, <laughs> of course, on all the Thailand words and how you use it, but all of them are positive. But like, yeah, but this way would be like, uh, go ahead. So it's a word to share, I will say, kind of in this in this moment, right? Come yeah, on, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's it. And um, yeah, okay, so yeah, go ahead. Push on. It's your time. No, no. Okay, so it's okay. Okay, guys. So uh, this is uh, the very end. See you in uh, June 2024. And just for the weekend, in order to thank all of you, uh, we have another discount code. It's going to be from today 6 p.m. until the 3rd of December at midnight. So. You know, this is to help us to running this event. As uh, you know, this is, we do this in our free time. So any of your help is going to be awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you to all, all people online. And uh, yeah. see you in June. <laughs>